the brain, so to speak, behind the whole event. And what is Rated Doctor? It's a marketing platform for doctors. So there's no joining fee and basic membership is free. So it's more like a LinkedIn for doctors. Uh, so that's what it is. Uh, the study day couldn't have happened without the generosity of our sponsors and our main sponsor, Ajfa Pharma. Um, thank you so much for coming today. All the way from Dubai, I really appreciate it. And we have other sponsors, Grafton Optical, Corsa Medical, Hack Trade UK, Scope, iStar Medical. So thank you so much for your generosity and support. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Usman Sheikh, who's the marketing director of Age for Pharma, to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Really appreciate it. Um, firstly, I'd like to start off by, again, thanking everyone for taking time out their busy schedules to join us here today. For those of you who are not familiar with Ajifa Pharma, we're a European manufacturer based in Austria. We have other offices in seven global locations. And we, we were established in 1947 with a key focus on ophthalmic products, both prescription and non-prescription. One of the products I'd like to just to highlight today is a, a cyclovir gafer, 3% eye ointment. Zavirax was discontinued in 2018. We've had this back on the market for the past 12 months. We've been working tirelessly with CCGs to try and get it back onto formulary. So it is first line treatment for hepatic keratitis. It's the only approved treatment for babies, nursing mothers, and pregnant women. The only acyclovir available in the UK market and covered by the NHS drug tariff. This is the first physical standalone meeting that we're doing today, so we're extremely grateful for everyone who's turned up. We have more planned for the next part of the year, the later part of this year, and next year also. Uh, a special thank you to our speakers today, so Professor Dua, Professor Dahlia, and Dr. Imran Masood, without whom this wouldn't be possible. Uh, enjoy the session, thank you. So today's speakers, um, I've got to warn you, the next slide is going to be a bit busy, so I'll let you have a good look. We have Professor Dua here, um, who has published more than 450 papers with more than 25,000 citations. Dua's layer in the cornea, so yeah. Uh, next we got Ms. Saeed, who's a um, consultant ophthalmologist here at Queen's Medical Center, and she's a full professor at Cairo in Egypt and there's over 70 publications. And Mr. Imran Masood, uh, who's from Birmingham, um, a key opinion leader in Glaucoma of the special interest in MIGS, the first surgeon in the UK to implant a hydrostriction canal stent, and he's a co-director of uh, Birmingham Institute for Glaucoma Research at the Institute for Translational Medicine. And he's also advisor to the NICE on interventional glaucoma procedures. So this will be the order of today. So we're going to kick off the first session with uh, allergic eye disease by Prof. Dua. Then we're going to have a, a, a longish coffee break, about 45 minutes. So I urge every one of you to spend time with our industry partners. I sort of, uh, learned a lot this morning by literally engaging with them. So I'm sure you'll learn a lot as well. So please go and pay them a visit. And then we have session two. And we're going to wrap up at, say, 5.15 with Q&A. And we're going to have some networking and social drinks at the bar. So with that, let me just uh, hand over to Prof. Duva for his talk. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction of all the speakers. And for once, I have a very recent picture of mine. Otherwise, they show a picture of mine, which is about 10 or 15 years younger, and it looks very different. Um, does this show the point? It does, yeah. So I'm going to take you through allergic eye diseases. It's mostly ocular surface disease. And after a heavy lunch, the first five slides could put you to sleep. But it, they're very important to understand what we're actually dealing with. Now, the immune system of the body is absolutely crucial. We'll all be dead without it. And the organisms will take over. Every day, millions of germs 
are interacting with us. We breathe them, we eat them, we touch them, they go into our eyes, nostrils, everywhere. And if it weren't for the immune system, we'd have a huge problem. And it's not just germs. All the foods and all the other plants and animals and the furs and skin we touch has lots of uh, molecules, proteins that can cause problems. So to fight against all of that, we have two kinds of immune systems broadly. One is what you're born with. It is there from the word go. These cells will attack anything that comes. Uh, they will attack uh, any organism or any protein of an organism comes to the body. They don't like it. It doesn't recognize it. These cells will attack them. So that's the first line of defense. And the other is the acquired immune response where the body sees a protein it has never seen before. Then it takes a little while to develop an army of cells against that. And then you have that ready. The next time it comes, the response is straight away. And different people in different parts of the world may have primed immune systems for different protein because you may encounter one bacteria or virus in one part of the world and not in the other. So those people will not have it. These people will have it. That's why it's called acquired. So these responses are a double-edged sword because if they are excessive, they can also attack the patient or the person in whom they are developing. And that leads to immune-mediated diseases. So not just fight the organism and defend yourself against that, but it could start attacking your body. And then they are known as hypersensitive or hypersensitivity reactions. And there are four types of these reactions. And they're all relevant to allergic eye disease. The type one is called the immediate hypersensitivity. So you contact the organism, immediately you start watery eye, red eye, sneezing, coughing. That's hypersensitivity. The word there is histamine. And therefore, we all hear about antihistamines for allergic eye disease because the chemical that is released is histamine and immunoglobin in E. They're re released by these cells, and they cause immediate vasodilation and exudation of uh, substances from the blood vessels into the tissue, so you get swelling and redness, etc. So these are uh, affect not just the eyes, but can affect uh, the, the, the mouth, the nose, and other parts of the body. The type 2 are less common, and these are the cytotoxic hypersensitivity reactions. These are cells that are destroying tissue, and they, like we see, uh, as in hemolytic anemia, anemia and blood transfusion. So when the reaction occurs, they go and destroy cells. The type 3 are more common, and these are immune complexes. So what happens when an antigen meets an antibody, they join together, they form an immune complex. It either precipitates, or if it is not in optimal concentration, it floats about as a soluble product. These soluble products get deposited on membranes, like blood vessel membranes or in the kidney membranes, and then they attract inflammatory cells. They're very, very potent chemoattractants, and you get inflammation. And in the eye, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, Steven Johnson syndrome are the two common conditions we see, relatively speaking, that, that these reactions are operating. And the final one is the type four, which is related to cells, not to antibodies, the first three have antibodies. The fourth one is cell-mediated. And these cells, rather than the antibodies, attract, attack tissue. And corneal graft rejection, for example, is one of the common examples uh, that we, we see in ophthalmology. Uh, but the picture gets even more confusing because it may start as one, trigger the other, and eventually it's a combination of all of them. So it's very difficult to select out one, except in the early stage of the disease, but if it's chronic, then you have both the antibody-mediated and the cell-mediated immune responses going on. Now, this whole orchestra has numerous players, and these are in the form of cells, and you can see there are many, many different sites. You name a cell, it's most likely to be involved over there. They're called the T lymphocytes, you can be helper cytotoxics, the B lymphocytes, NK cells, mast cells, basophils, eosinophils, all these cells, they give names to cells, they all participate in these immune responses, and they release chemicals when they are activated. And these chemicals are given a whole lot of names, and histamine like is one of them, immunoglobulin E is another, interferon, immunoglobulin G, 
and they then combine to cause these reactions. Now, why is all this information necessary? It gives you some idea. Even if you retain 1% of this, you get there's something going on in the background. So when you have to treat, you have to treat that something. Rather than what you see, you're actually treating that phenomenon at the back that's going on. So what is that phenomenon? To understand that, there are three terms, and this is probably the last of the five slides. The ATOP, an atopic individual is one who has uh, the, the ability to response and immuno, uh, make an immunoglobulin E response. That is very important in the immediate hypersensitivity. So as you can see there, 5 to 20 percent of the population is atopic, which means they have the ability to mount a more than required IgE response. So then when, you is ex when it is excessive, you get a problem. And what is allergy? Allergy is sensitivity to the environmental antigen. So if I eat chilies, I get a very severe reaction. Somebody can eat a ton of chilies, get no reaction. So I've got an allergy to a product. And we all have allergies to different products. But if you are atopic, that's even worse because your ability to mount the Ig response is more even for a small amount of antigen compared to the other person. And the allergen is the substance to which you get allergy. So these are the terms we need to know. An atopic individual, allergy, the response to an allergen. Allergen is usually a protein but can be any, any product. So on the basis of this background information, you can wake up now, we have uh, these different types of allergic conjunctivitis of the eye. They all call this AAC, ACC, PAC. In simple terms, you get acute allergic conjunctivitis, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, perennial, which is all the year round, and they're all th the first three are more or less the same thing, only the timing is different. Then you have vernal, atopic, remember the word atopy, and then giant papillary conjunctivitis. So acute allergic conjunctivitis occurs immediately. It's a one-off to a certain antigen or allergen in the environment. It can occur at any age, but usually common in children because as you grow older, your body sense adapts to that, that antigen and you become less sensitive. And it can affect people who have atopy and those who have so they, they, they need not necessarily have an ability to make an exaggerated IgE response. It can affect both types of individuals. And the symptoms are intense itching, swelling of the lids, redness, and it's usually self-limiting. The allergy, allergen gets washed out or is destroyed by the body and everything goes back to normal. It does not leave any lasting effect and therefore usually does not require any treatment. But if you treat it with cold water or some antihistamines for a day or two, it will settle. And that's an example of the reaction. You see the redness of the lids and the swelling of the conjunctiva and the redness of the conjunctiva as well. And here's another example of the same thing. Now, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis is exactly the same thing, but happening only in a particular season. And that is because in that season, the allergen is most abundant. And what we find is that, you know, we say hay fever, and that's during the, the, the spring or summer, and we see in the UK, a fairly large one quarter of the population almost is affected, and it's usually due to this rye pollen and the Timothy grass pollen, which causes it, but it's often due to tree pollens as well. Uh, it is a mild condition, but a lot of people take time off sick because of that, and the burden on the labor market is huge, and on, of course, the, of course, the employers who are paying for those people for their sick leave. Uh, the diagnosis by, by history, uh, you can look at the patient, the clinical signs uh, are mild, but that redness, itching symptom together will tell you. And they will tell you it ha occurs every summer, it occurs every spring, it only lasts for two or three months, and then I'm okay. And like I said, hay fever is a common example of that. And these are the symptoms, the same as the previous symptoms. But blurring of vision can occur, and you have to remember this, and it will come through in other talks as well. Uh, one of the most important component of sight, proper focusing of light, is your tear film. And you'll see outside, therefore, everybody is selling tear film products because when the tear film is disrupted, you're focusing, the polish is gone. And when that polish is gone, focusing is, and that's why they can complain of blurring of vision because they have to blink frequently to replenish their tear film. 
and, and, and that's when putting some teardrops might be useful. And when you may, you may argue, well, they get a watery eye, and then why do you want to put more tears in the eye? But the, this, the understanding is that the watery eye is not follow, forming a film, it is running water, but to stabilize it on the cornea and give the cornea polish, you still need to put teardrops in the presence of a watery eye. And these are the symptoms exactly like I said for the previous, you know. But one important thing which as optometrists, as nurses and doctors we don't do is turn the lid around. And it's not always easy, but if the patient has eyelashes, you hold the eyelash, you put a paper clip at the back of the tarsal plate and you can flip it. Uh, sometimes you can do it without a paper clip, but if they don't have eyelashes, then don't bother because you can't do it unless you hold with the forceps and that you won't do in the clinic. But make it a habit to try and turn the lid around. You discover so many things, including foreign bodies and bits of grass or something underneath the lids. So you can see normal tarsal plate of the flip lid is pinkish, but it can be quite red and hyperemic in people with seasonal or acute allergic conjunctivitis. There is no corneal involvement. No corneal involvement in acute allergic, no corneal involvement in seasonal allergic, um, and there is no corneal involvement in the perineal allergic conjunctivitis either. Very important distinction from the other two or three to come. So the perineal is this exactly the same again, but is all the year round because the antigen is present all the year round. So you take them out from one country to another and they're really good. They come back and usually it happens, people who go out on holiday are fine, they come back to UK, so we're full of allergens of all kinds, they're in your carpet, in your bed, in your pillow covers, and that allergen is what causes these problems. The commonest one in the UK is this dust mite. And this mite is uh, it's excrement and it's protein in the thing, it sheds and when it dies, it's, it crumbles and all the protein. And it's like, seems quite yucky, but we are living with it our lives day in and day out all the time. And that's what is causing this problem and which lasts all the year round. And it, this is the commonest bug that causes this in the United Kingdom. And again, you look under the eyelids and you can see uh, redness, but that's about it, different grades of redness. And like I said, the important distinction, all three of these do not affect the cornea, and that is very important. So any visual blurring is temporary, and it recovers fully, which is different from the fourth variety, which is vernal keratoconjunctivitis. And this has a wide variation in the European population between 1, and 10 to 10, uh, 1 to 10 in 10, thousand population in Africa it is much more and the age is variable usually childhood and it can be a blinding condition because it does affect the cornea and the corneal blindness is is the reason why people don't see and when there is excessive amount of this going on for a long time other infections supervene because the condition with all the proteinaceous fluid bacteria, viruses, and parasites can, can flourish in the eye, and that makes the condition worse. So the pathogenesis is quite complex. As we saw, it is usually a type 4 uh, reaction. There's a family history of atopy, or the patient may have it and uh, himself, and it's a combination of the type 1 and the type 4. Like I said, eventually it's all type, predominantly type 4, hypersensitivity with the cells playing a major role, but then the antibodies also kick in, the eosinophils, IgE, basophils, and mast cells, and it's a mixed uh, kind of a reaction to all these elements of the immune system. And it is assumed that the hormones may also play a role because it becomes much less after puberty. So you have to maintain the patient, make sure the cornea is preserved. Once they cross puberty, chances are it will settle. So you have to assure the mothers that they can keep the treatment going but he will grow out of the condition. They don't always do that, but they often do. And what you will see is this. When you turn the lid around, you will see these papillae. The problem with these papillae is that once they form, they don't go away in a hurry. So even in an eye which is quiet and asymptomatic, you will see them. In an eye which is actively inflamed, you will see large papillae, much redder, a lot of mucoid discharge. So we see that if the patient is asymptomatic, we don't treat it. But if you see that, we do treat it. 
And the point is that the papillae do not go away. Therefore, whenever you see a papilla, you don't have to treat it. It's only if the patient is symptomatic. And eventually, there's a lot of scarring, and this can cause further problems if the lids are scarred and they start to turn around, or the lid is scarred to the bulbar conjunctiva, then you have difficulty in opening the lids and the problems that come from that. And here's another example of this, and you can see the scarring that has occurred between the papillae, but the papillae are still there. These papillae are actually a core of blood vessels and surrounded by uh, uh, scar tissue, and it squeezes the blood vessels and the soft tissue out, and they become like lumpy. They can be distributed along the limbus, this, then they're called tarantas dots. You can have corneal vascularization, as you will see over here in these patients, and that causes problems of its own and perpetuates the inflammatory response, which goes on and on. And then it affects the cornea in, in many different ways. Vascularization is one, but it causes this tiny little dot. You put fluorescein, they'll all light up as green dots, so you get fine, diffuse uh, punctate keratitis, also called microerosions. You get larger, coarser lesions called macroerosions. You can get a plaque on the cornea. Uh, where's that? Uh, yeah, so there you can see there'll be plaques on the cornea. This is a large white plaque right in the center of the cornea. And these are very difficult to treat and sometimes have to be surgically removed. And people with allergic eye disease, not just vernal keratoconjunctivitis, which is more common, they tend to rub their eyes because they're itchy. And rubbing eyes is the only known association very strongly linked to keratoconus, where the eye becomes conical in shape, as you see over here. So corneal involvement in many different ways happens. And this is the same patient with keratoconus, with fluorescein. You can see that's the apex of the cone. The surface is staining. It's rough. The cells are falling off. New cells are coming. So various ways in which the cornea gets involved and affects sight. Now, atopic keratoconjunctivitis, which is the, the, the next in line, the next category, it is the similar sort of thing occurring in patients who have a strong atopy. So they have history of eczema, history of asthma, and eye problems. So when you have these, they may have dermatitis due to the eczema as well. And when you see these together, you know this is atopic keratoconjunctivitis. There, the papillary reaction is not so prominent, but it can be. And, and only the history will tell them apart. And sometimes you can do IgE testing in these patients. But the features that you see are slightly different to vernal in that the lids are more involved because that's the skin being involved than the conjunctival surface alone that we see more often with the vernal keratoconjunctivitis. So eczema of the facial and the eyelid skin, uh, the rest of the features are like VKC in the eye and it also involves the cornea and therefore is sight threatening. Again, the pathogenesis is very complex like we saw with vernal keratoconjunctivitis, but this is also associated with keratoconus, with cataract, because the lens of the eye develops from the ectoderm, which is the same layer from which the skin develops. So the lens of the eye is connected to the skin. If there's skin problem, then the lens also will show a problem and you can get cataract and also retinal detachment and vitreous uh, liquefaction and vitreous detachment. So these are some of these associations which can be uh, more complex with atopic, but not with vernal, <coughs> excuse me. And this, again, affects a fairly large, one-fifth of the population uh, can have, and this atopic keratoconjunctivitis occurs in 20 to 40 percent of these patients. And, uh, and, and patients with, with the skin disease, uh, there are various other incidences that are written over there. Uh, you can see with concomitant eczema or with asthma, it's more in men than in women, and the peak age is 30 to 50 years. So. Uh, it can, it can spread over a wide range and, and most of your working life is then affected with this condition at the big impact on your ability to earn a living. So if you look at the, the, the symptoms, so let's go back, yeah. So they will, they will uh, the VKC will not have a, a seasonal variation and the, the symptoms 
they flare up each time the skin or the asthma flares up, they flare up. So sometimes they come to us and we treat them with cyclosporine and the skin gets better. Sometimes they have eye problem, they go to the dermatologist who treats the skin and the eye gets better. So whatever the treatment you give generally affects them, uh, um, the whole body, which is good because anybody can treat that. So what are the signs uh, of these? You see in the, it's not showing up in the screen. Only when I go back, it shows up. See, there's nothing there, nothing there. Okay, so the, the point here is you can see this excoriation and you see these uh, little ulcers on the lid margins which are very common with atopic eye disease and not so much with uh, the um, vernal. Now here there was a picture which is not showing and let me see if I go back. So the pictures are not showing through. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's why I said, you know, we should have used my own laptop. Anyway, uh, some, I mean, they're not, not that important, but I think we'll just go back straight to um, this uh, final condition called giant papillary conjunctivitis. It is fitted in with these conditions, but it is really not truly an allergic reaction. It is neither due to allergy nor due to atopy. Uh, it usually occurs due to chronic inflammation, like a loose suture causing repetitive trauma or rubbing can cause these papillae to form. And they are quite large papillae, and they are found uh, in, the, in the skin, and they're given different names according to the size of the papillae, the giant micro papillae, uh, but they are, uh, the inflammation is minimal and they do not affect the cornea. So other than vernal and atopic, the other allergic conditions do not affect the cornea and therefore do not cause blindness, do not affect vision, whereas uh, those two do. And that's why it's important to distinguish between those two and if you're in the primary care sector, you know you can treat everything except VKC and AKC, which you need to refer if there is a cornea involvement. Otherwise, even that can be treated in the, in the community. So these are examples of the giant papillary conjunctivitis, as you see over here. And sometimes it can be very mild. And uh, contact lenses, chronic contact lens wear can cause giant papillary conjunctivitis because constant rubbing uh, under the lids and orbital prosthesis and implants can cause it. So these are some other examples of that condition. Uh, so how do we treat them? Uh, if you know the allergen, you avoid it. If you don't know it, and often you don't know it, then you treat the acute symptoms. So there are a whole host of antihistamine drops available. Some people, if they're having systemic symptoms or even their nose is running, then you can give them tablets of antihistamines, but you warn them that they cause drowsiness and that can affect their ability to, to work and especially to drive. But antihistamines, usually topical, are good enough uh, and sometimes, like I said, systemic with the other symptoms, when the other symptoms are present. Uh, you have mast cells stabilized. Now, mast cells are the ones that degranulate to release histamine. So if you stabilize the mast cells, then you will prevent them from releasing the histamine. But once it's released, then antihistamines will do the job, but mast cell stabilizers won't. So you give both. And often there's a combination of the two, and those are the various uh, names. Some of them are the trade names, where the, like olopatidine is a combination of a mast cell stabilizer and an antihistamine, so it has a dual effect. But sodium chromoglycate, uh, again, is a mast cell stabilizer, but not an antihistamine. So if the patient comes in active disease, you treat with an antihistamine, but if you know it's seasonal, then during the season, they can start the mast cell stabilizer and it'll stop the disease from happening. Uh, and then, of course, there are non-inflammatory, non, sorry, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that, are help, that help, and then, of course, there are the steroids. 
There are many, many different kinds of steroids. You start with the least concentration or the, the ones with the least potential for side effects, and we know the two main side effects. In fact, there are three main side effects of steroids uh, that are given topically. One of them is cataract over long-term use. And the thing about cataract which people don't understand is you may use FML, which is a weaker steroid, or you may use betamethasone, dexamethasone, at the other end of the spectrum. It is a dose-related effect. So it will take longer with one, like a quicker with the other. It's not that one will not cause and the other will not cause. But eventually, when the cumulative dose reaches a certain level, then you'll like to get and mostly posterior subcapsular cataract. The other is glaucoma. So about 10 to 15 percent of the population responds to steroids with, with raising their pressure. It is reversible in the initial stages. So if ever you start anybody on steroids, no matter how weak the steroid is, they must have constant pressure checks. Otherwise, you might uh, end up, and I have seen this happen, patients with extremely deep cups lost all their field of vision and a lot of their vision as well just because they were treating the surface condition with steroids. And the third less known one, but it happens, is reactivation of herpetic eye disease. And many of these atopic individuals have herpetic corneal problems uh, and they will reactivate if you're there on steroids and, and then you have problems. So one has to watch out for those as well. There are steroid sparing immunosuppressive agents uh, and we have a few of them in the market. Uh, Icurvis is a cyclosporin preparation. In, the, in America, there's lifity grass and there is uh, protopic. Protopic is probably going to come as an eye preparation in the UK, not yet there but we have a skin cream and we tend to use this 0.3%, sorry, the 0.03% off-label to treat uh, atopic eye disease, and particularly when the skin is involved and it works like magic, and I'll show you a picture. And then you have artificial tears, like I said earlier, when they have thick ropey discharge with AKC and VKC, then the mucolytic agents like the uh, eye lube helps to dissolve the mucus, and if they're filamentary keratitis, helps to dissolve the mucus. And then sometimes, if they're very large papillae, they have to be surgically excised. If there's a plaque, it, in the early stages, it can disappear with the treatment, but uh, often you have to go in and excise the plaque, and you may cover it with the amniotic membrane to, to allow that area to heal. So a AAC, SAC, and PAC, the allergic, seasonal, and acute, and the perineal, just drops, usually self-limiting, if there is concomitant infection, give an antibiotic, otherwise not. VKC, uh, you need most of them, including steroid treatment. And, and in, in the, the long term, if you want to spare steroids, then you switch. So you induce remission with steroids, and then you switch to cyclosporin or protopic. And, and uh, in the atopic patients where the risk of cataract and cornea problems is higher, you may have to resort to surgery for those conditions as well. Uh, in giant papillary conjunctivitis, the, the most common re reason to remove a large papilla is because it, it grabs the contact lens and doesn't let the contact lens move on the eye, and then you have to take out one or two of them to allow the area to become smooth uh, before they can tolerate a contact lens. Now, this patient, if you look at this patient here, you can see uh, how bad the lids are, how excoriated they are, and a sh very sharp pain they get when that comes in contact with water. And look at this crusting. And this patient was treated with protopic cream, and it's as though you've just wiped the board clean. You can see how smooth and clean the lids have become with this uh, tacrolimus skin ointment applied to the lid margin. So it's an off-label use of the drug, but it's extremely effective. And just to finish off with this summary slide, so. Those are the six the C's at the end, the conjunctive ITDs that we've listed. The age group is slightly different. Uh, the predisposing factor is slightly different, as you can see in GPC. is the contact lens variable, but no history of atopy or allergy to anything. In the UK, uh, uh, VKC and AKC is comparatively rare, and you're comparing this to Africa and India, for example, but uh, overall it is quite debilitating to the patients who suffer from it. 
The corneal involvement is the key, and I've stressed that already two or three times. Only these two conditions affect the cornea. Hence, they have to be monitored very carefully. Uh, the morbidity corresponds to the corneal involvement, and the need for steroid also is f related to that. But the top three conditions which do not affect the cornea and are self-limiting, one treats them with other drugs, not steroids, whereas these two need steroids, and this one hardly needs any treatment. Thank you. Unless there's one pressing question, uh, one or two, yeah. Any questions? Yeah? Can I just ask about the scope of the group? Um, can you prescribe that to us by medical treatment? Yeah. So, no, you can prescribe it. So what, because it's a skin cream, and if you say protopic cream to be instilled in the eye three times, that was him. <laughs> uh, to be instilled in the eye once a day, the pharmacy will block it. They won't prescribe it. If you say protopic cream to be a cream to be applied to the skin of the lids once a day or twice is the maximum I prescribe it, and I go for the 0 0.03 rather than the 0.1 percent. It will be prescribed when you tell the patient it's a big tube with a large opening, not a nozzle. So you squirt a little bit on your finger and just rub it. And if a bit goes in the eye, it's good. Doesn't matter. But there are patients who've strictly stuck to the regime of applying it only to the skin, and it has helped the eye as well. So it does go through. Uh, and that's why, but if it goes in the eye, it does sting a bit, but it's very beneficial. How long would you then say to, to use it for as well as uh, I go by the signs, and when the signs clear, you tend to stop. You don't taper it, you just stop it, and if it comes back, you start again. Right, so until mm -hmm. it stops and then yeah. you can But uh, long-term use of, uh, of uh, these immunosuppressive agents in some patients can trigger malignancy, particularly if they are taking it systemically, uh, not the topical ones, <laughs> although if they use it chronically, the basal cell carcinoma might be an issue. Uh, but again, the patient's perspective is so important because we had a corneal graft patient who was very sensitive to steroids with high pressure. So we gave him cyclosporin orally for a number of years, and his graft was clear. Then he developed basal cell carcinoma. And we said, we have to stop because it's going to get... He said, I'd rather die seeing than blind with no cancer. So he didn't want to stop it because that's one eye and that was giving him sight, and this is slow growing, he says, I don't mind if... Uh, so, uh, of course, we tried to excise that and just carried on with the, with the cyclosporin. So that's a small risk, but it's very small. Big round of applause, and then we'll okay. save the question. Oh, thank you, Prof. Uh, apologies for the slides. I think it was just a compatibility issue. Uh, next, we have Mr. Imran Masood. He's going to be talking about uh, glaucoma diagnosis and management. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the kind invite to come and speak at this meeting. Um, I've been given the challenge of trying to cover the whole of glaucoma diagnosis and management in the next 30 minutes. But what I'm going to focus on really is the key pointers in terms of what advances um, have happened in the last sort of decade and how are we managing glaucoma in 2023? So I think the first thing I would say is that um, glaucoma is a condition, unfortunately, which is still uh, very often missed. Um, really, the, the, the mainstay of treatment for glaucoma um, is obviously um, to lower the IOP, but you have to identify cases early. And unfortunately, we still see patients too late. And the biggest risk factor for blindness in glaucoma is late presentation. Now, when you're diagnosing glaucoma, I think the most important thing that you can do is actually dilate the pupil and have a look at the disc. I think that is the, the, the best way of diagnosing glaucoma. So a skilled clinician looking at the optic nerve um, in a, on a slit lamp is still the best way of diagnosing glaucoma. 
We have good adjuncts like OCT, but OCT doesn't always give you the answer. In fact, sometimes you can get false positives and false negatives. We also need a uh, visual field. Again, this, um, there's a problem here because I'm not seeing my image here. I can see it here. Can you see it? Oh, okay, so I have to go back. Okay, so and that's a, yeah, it's okay at the moment, okay. Um, so obviously the, the, the other tests that we do to diagnose glaucoma is uh, visual fields, and the standard for that is your uh, Humphrey visual field. I know in the community people do screening fields, but really this is obviously the gold standard. Um, um, sorry about this, I think there's a, there is an issue with your setup mm -hmm. here, but anyway, we'll carry on. Um, so one of the key questions is why does the intraocular pressure go up? Because the intraocular pressure is the main risk factor for glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And we believe, although we're not sure, is that in open angle glaucoma, in, in any case, the commonest cause of glaucoma around the world, what happens is that you get increased resistance to outflow in this area here of the angle, the trabecular meshwork. This is Schlem's canal. And so the fluid, the aqueous humor, can't pass as easily through the trabecular meshwork and so the intraocular pressure has to rise to maintain a constant flow of fluid through the eye. But unfortunately, that rise in intraocular pressure impacts on the optic nerve. The optic nerve is the only point in the eye which is the, the weak area. Um, it's the, an opening in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the eyeball, and that's where all the pressure and the stress concentrates. We know that in angle closure, the mechanism is uh, the iris directly coming into contact with the trabecular meshwork. So the glaucomas are actually a heterogeneous group of diseases where the characteristic changes are the optic nerve head and visual field. And raised IOP is the main established risk factor or the main modifiable risk factor for glaucoma. The thing I would say here is that even primary open angle glaucoma, your bulk standard glaucoma is heterogeneous in its presentation and its progression. And that's why you can't, if there isn't one size fit all when it comes to this disease. And this uh, scheme really shows you the sort of very basic classification of glaucoma. Uh, you have the open angle ones, you have the closed angle ones, and you have primary, secondary in, in each of these categories. And these are some of the sort of various diagnostic entities that you will recognize. Now, in terms of diagnosing and managing glaucoma, one of the important things, and this is also uh, important from the point of view of optometrists referring, is to phenotype the patient, to understand the risk factors. And the risk factors for glaucoma are age. As you get older, glaucoma is more common because the optic nerve gets weaker. Uh, race, so in Afro-Caribbeans, uh, the uh, preponderance of glaucoma is much higher. Family history, very important. Refractive error. Increasingly, we've recognized that in myopia, in myopes, glaucoma is more common. And the difficulty is the optic disc interpretation is also complex and challenging in these patients. Uh, central corneal thickness. And then you've got slightly weaker factors like migraine, Raynaud's, and steroid use. So if you look at IOP and race, for any given IOP, the proportion of patients who are African Caribbean who have glaucoma is much, much higher than those who are um, Caucasian. So there's something about the optic nerve head in Afro Caribbeans that make them much more vulnerable to the effect of raised intraocular pressure. Family history. So the population risk for glaucoma is about 2%. Um, when you have a first degree relative affected with glaucoma, that risk increases to 22%. Um, so about tenfold higher. And in general, the glaucoma phenotype in a family is very similar. So if you have a family history of blindness, then you have to be extra careful about that particular patient and how you manage them. And so it's very important not just to ask, have you got a family history of glaucoma, but what actually happened to your relatives? Did they, were they treated with eye drops? Did they end up needing surgery? Did they end up going blind? So those are very, very important questions. Um, to take when you're asking about the family history. Corneal thickness, another important factor. The mean in the population is around 550. It is established that it, it is a risk factor for progression of ocular hypertension to glaucoma. That was shown in the OAT study. It's a risk factor for presenting with more advanced disease. And the question is, does having a thinner cornea affect the IOP or does it affect the biomechanics of the eye as a whole? 
And we know that CCT is reduced in NTG, normal tension glaucoma, and in Afro-Caribbean patients. The other interesting thing over the last um, few years um, has been the ocular response analyzer. Um, and this is being used more and more. Um, and this gives you an idea of the uh, biomechanics of the cornea. So, for example, you can have a thin cornea, which is rigid, but you can have a thick cornea, which is more pliable. So the corneal thickness by itself perhaps doesn't give you all of the information. So uh, what we're measuring here is something called corneal hysteresis using um, this device called the ocular response analyzer. And in essence, the way you measure the hysteresis or the deformability of the cornea is you apply a, 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 an air puff to the cornea, uh, air puff pressure, and the cornea will flatten and give off this signal um, off on the surface when it's completely flat, just like a mirror. And then the pressure continues, and on the way out, the cornea will give another signal. So there's a, a sort of a deformation, and then as it kind of recovers, you get a second peak. And the difference between these two gives you a measure of the hysteresis. And what's been shown is that um, that low hysteresis reading, so if you have a low hysteresis, that means the eye is the more rigid, that is a risk factor for glaucoma progression, okay? And so that may reflect the rigidity of the scleral opening um, at the back of the eye, and therefore the stresses and strains that are going to affect the optic nerve are greater in eyes with low hysteresis. Um, now, myopia, and I've mentioned this already, uh, another risk. Now, this is particularly important from the point of view of LASIK, okay? There are a number of patients I've seen over the years who've gone blind from glaucoma or lost substantial amounts of vision who previously had LASIK in the early 2000s. And the reason for this is they keep going to see their optometrist, the pressure is normal every time they're seen. The discs are difficult to interpret, and so the patient gradually loses vision while they're under the care of the optometrist. So very important that you ask them about a history of laser uh, refractive surgery, okay? More and more patients are having LASIK done, and so the corneas are thinner, the, the biomechanics are different, but as I said, the myopes are also the group which are at higher risk of glaucoma. So very important that you, uh, you think about these things. Hyperopia, obviously there's a risk of narrow angle glaucoma. Migraine um, is a softer risk factor, but may be important in normal tension glaucoma. Diabetes, we're not quite sure whether that increases the risk or doesn't affect things at all. Uh, conceptually, you might think that it would because diabetes affects the microvasculature of all structures in the eye. Optometrists are increasingly using OCT now to um, diagnose glaucoma. This is a fairly barn door case of an afro garabian patient um, where the signal is all red. Very important that you have a look at the whole um, scan. You don't just rely on this um, look at the quality of your scan, the segmentation, okay? Um, and the other issue is that a lot of the databases that are used for these OCT machines are not necessarily in Asian or Afro-Caribbean patients. They're usually in patients of European descent. So again, that's something else that might affect interpretation. Uh, you often get referred patients with suspicious looking discs. So this disc looks quite suspicious, when you, but when you do the RNFL, it's completely normal. So it helps, in my view, in diagnosing when there isn't glaucoma. Um, this is another one. Uh, if you have a look here, this patient uh, was sent in with a cup disc on the right side. But if you have a look here, it's because the disc is much bigger. Okay, so that's another classic example of a patient who doesn't have glaucoma, but the RNFL is completely normal. Now, the diagnosis is not always straightforward. So who thinks this patient has glaucoma? Put your hand up. No one, okay? <laughs> okay, so that is a, a quite a cup disc. What would you expect the field to be like? Quite bad, right? Minus 10? Okay, that's the fields, okay? So this patient has, has came, came to me for a second opinion, has been followed up in their local eye clinic for many, many years, uh, pressure around 19, 20, and they've been told they're okay. They're far from okay. This is a patient who has what we call cliff edge discs. When they start to go, he's going to get rapid progression of vision. So 
From my perspective, he's going to need an escalation of his therapy. He might even need surgery on that eye. He's only in his 50s, okay? So the important thing is, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, the disc is king. You have to look at the optic disc. Often, you have to have substantial damage to your optic nerve before you get a field defect. So pe people say, well, mild glaucoma is minus four. Is it? And actually, you need to do 50% of your ganglion cells before you get a field defect. So is that actually mild glaucoma? I think we need to rethink some of the things that, that, that we're told. Okay, therapy. So in medicine, we treat patients for two reasons, symptom relief and prognostic benefit. In glaucoma, in primary open angle glaucoma, we are treating patients for prognostic reasons. And what that means is we're trying to alter the natural history of their disease. So if you don't treat a glaucoma patient, the likelihood is that over their lifetime they will go blind. And what you're trying to do is to alter that natural history of the disease. And what we know is that if you look at this graph, this kind of shows you visual function versus age. We know that if you uh, do not intervene, the patient will go blind in their lifetime. If you intervene early, hopefully you can maintain their visual function over their lifetime. But remember, even with treatment, in some patients, glaucoma will continue to progress, albeit more slowly. So the idea is to change the rate of progression, okay? Um, if they present late, so again, this is the issue about late presentation, they are much further down in terms of the number of ganglion cells left. So trying to keep them seeing during their lifetime is much more of a challenge. Okay. So when we think about glaucoma therapy, you have to ask yourself, what are we actually treating? We're treating a risk factor. We're not treating a disease, okay? Um, the major risk factor is IOP, okay? This is a bit like if you imagine someone has a cholesterol of seven, they're going to feel fine. But it's the, the, the impact that high cholesterol is going to have 10 years from now by causing a heart attack or a stroke. So in the same way, when you're treating IOP, what you're trying to do is to preserve the end organ, which is the optic nerve, um, subsequent, in subsequent years. So we know that lowering IOP reduces the conversion of ocular hypertension to POAG. We know that it also reduces POAG progression. Very important that you consider patient's attitude to risk when you consider therapy, because a lot of these patients, particularly those that you're thinking about operating on um, or suggesting surgery to, they have no symptoms. And this is a difficulty in glaucoma. In early glaucoma, you don't have symptoms. Or even in moderate and sometimes in advanced glaucoma, you don't have any symptoms. And you have to convince the patient that if they don't have surgery, things are going to get worse. And often what I will do is I will show them their visual fields, and that is the way that you can show a patient that there is a problem. Okay. So um, the importance of glaucoma treatment is to maintain the patient's uh, visual function and related quality of life at a sustainable cost. And the cost of treatment in terms of convenient inconvenience and side effects as well as financial implications for the individual and society requires careful evaluation. And quality of life we know is closely linked with visual function and patients with early to moderate glaucoma may have good visual function and, and modest reduction in quality of life but quality of life is, is considerably reduced when both eyes have advanced visual function loss. So the idea is that we have to prevent progression, prevent blindness, but also maintain the patient's quality of life. Now, this was uh, one of the biggest uh, trials done on the, um, the impact of latanoprost on progression of glaucoma. So this was basically the UK GTS study published in The Lancet. And what it showed was that at 24 months, the patients who were treated with uh, latanoprost, less patients progressed, um, and in the placebo, more patients progressed, okay? The difference was about uh, 10, 10 to 15 percent. Now, the point I'm making here is that even those patients who are treated can progress, okay? And that may be due to multiple other factors. It may be the eye pressure isn't low enough. We don't fully understand that, but that's the point I was making earlier, that you have to slow down the rate of progression for that patient so that they don't go blind in their lifetime. So if we look at glaucoma therapy in the 2023, what are we now doing? We're obviously still using medical therapy. 
Um, laser SLT, as, as you will have heard, has taken a front line in the sort of battle against glaucoma. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, ex there's been a massive explosion in the field of minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And on the horizon, there is also depot therapy. Uh, this, these are basically uh, drug implants you can put into the eye, which elute drug over sort of a year or two years. And they're on the horizon, probably in the next two years, we'll start to see them um, commercially. So SLT laser I, has probably, I mean, it's been around for about 20 years, but only in the last three or four years have we seen big randomized trials coming out showing that it is uh, effective. Now, and the NICE have issued these guidelines very recently based on the, the LIGHT trial, which I'm sure you've all heard about, um, that SLT laser is now first-line treatment or should be offered as first-line to glaucoma and ocular hypertension patients. So what did the LIGHT trial actually show? It was completed in 2019. It was basically um, a randomized controlled trial comparing SL, uh, this is treatment naive patients, it was com comparing SLT laser to eye drops. And the primary outcome measure was quality of life with secondary outcome measures such as visual acuity, IOP, cost, disease progression, and need for glaucoma surgery. And I think this is one of the best trials in glaucoma that's happened in the last 20 years. Um, the, the sort of headline take home messages are that at 36 months, 95% of patients are undergoing SLT were at target IOP, okay, with 75% of patients off eye drops. 36%, 36 eyes in the eye drop group should show disease progression compared to 23 in the SLT group. So there's more progression in the eye drop group. Now, perhaps that's because patients don't put their drops in properly or when drops go in, they don't control the diurnal fluctuation and SLT does it better. But certainly this is the first trial to show the impact of this. And this is very, very interesting. In the eye drop group, 11 patients required trabeculectomy surgery compared to zero in the SLT group. And I think this is a very, very big difference that this trial is showing. And the cost analysis showed that from a cost effectiveness point of view, SLT was more cost effective than, than eye drops. And so uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology have also added SLT as their first line treatment. In terms of what the ideal protocol is to treat patients, uh, this is what the LIGHT trial used. So those of you doing SLT need to think about this. Uh, you treat 360 degrees of the meshwork, 100 non-overlapping shots, 25 per quadrant, and the energy you decide by the, uh, when you're doing the laser because you look for a reaction, which is the number of bubbles you see. You don't want to see too much in the way of bubbles. Just to give you the six-year data for this same trial, um, again, just the sort of uh, headline, I'll just give you the... Um, so trabeculectomy, so 70% of patients remained at or less than target IOP without the need for medical or surgical treatments. That's very effective. Trabeculectomy was required in 32 eyes in the um, drops arm compared with 13 in the SLT arm. I'll just flick through this. Now, in terms of medication, uh, these are the medications. We still have these medications available. There are some new drugs on the horizon. These are your rho kinase inhibitors. Um, they are just about uh, coming into uh, the market commercially. But the other big uh, area where there's been an explosion, again, um, is this area of MIGS, or microinvasive glaucoma surgery. So a huge number of devices. So. Um, I was quite fortunate in that I, I got into this in 2009 when um, we started using the eye stent. So I've been in this for about a decade, but there's been a huge explosion in the number of devices that are now available to treat glaucoma uh, minimally invasively. And these are some of the devices that I've used over the years at various time points. Um, we can now do trabeculectomy. Um, um, in a much more uh, minimally invasive manner. This shunt called the Presaflow shunt um, basically goes into the anterior chamber angle and drains the fluid into the subconjunctival space. Um, and this can be done in, a, in about 20 minutes, half an hour. And I think really it, the, the modern sort of glaucoma management scheme is, uh, is laser probably first now um, and medications. And then you, when the patient gets a cataract or sometimes even in patients who have very mild cataract and they're over the age of 60, I will take the lens out and do a mixed procedure. 
um, and then Trav and Tube have been relegated to further down the line. But what it does mean is we can manage our patients better with less medication and hopefully they will progress less. We know from lots of studies that cataract surgery itself can be effective, but the, the effect of cataract um, extraction on IOP can wane after a period of time, and this has been shown in various studies. So this is the IOP dropping in the cataract extraction group, but it starts to go up again. But if you add a MIGS procedure, like an eye stent or a hydrus, then that IOP reduction is maintained. We think that cataract extraction, if you uh, think about it, if you remove a big lens and put this little plastic lens in, it actually uh, alters the tone in the trabecular beams probably, and that's how it's reducing the IOP. This is a, a randomized trial of uh, the hydra stent compared to cataract surgery. And what this really shows is that in the presence of the stent, more patients at 24 months are medication free. So almost twice as many patients are medication free compared to the cataract group alone, okay? And the reason they did the, the way they did these studies was they compared cataract surgery plus the stent versus cataract surgery alone, because cataract surgery alone, we do also know it lowers pressure. But what they found was that basically if you use a stent, then more patients are, are off medical therapy with a controlled pressure at target, off medication at the, the two-year period. And some of these trials have now looked at five years, and at five years, that difference is maintained. These are some of the other newer devices that we've been using. These are catheters that go into Schlem's canal. Um, and I'll show you some cases in a minute. Um, now, one of the things that I've been very interested in is that it's all very well getting people off eye drops, one drop or two drops when you do these procedures in mild disease. But the question is, can we actually use these to do safe glaucoma surgery in more complex patients? And I'm just going to give you an example of uh, two or three patients. Um, this is a very complicated case. So he's got angle closure glaucoma in the context of relative anterior microphthalmos. So he's got a small anterior chamber, but the back of the eye is relatively large. So actually he's myopic. He hasn't got a hyperopic pr prescription. And he came to me uh, on every medication under the sun. Uh, his vision's reduced due to glaucoma damage, and his pressure was still um, 15 in one eye and 33 in the other eye. And I'm just sorry, the field. And that's the field in one eye, that's the field. So this patient has good going, blinding glaucoma. So this is what we did for him. So he, because he's got an angle closure component, this is actually a relatively clear lens. We're going to do a clear lens extraction here. Um, and we're just opening up, the, this is a lens capsule we're opening up. And um, we open this up and then hydro dissection to free up the lens. We use phaco emulsification to break up the lens. And then we put our foldable uh, lens into the bag. And now this is the important bit. Um, we're going to look at the angle. So you can see here that the iris is stuck to the trabecular meshwork. And what we're doing is we're peeling away the iris off the trabecular meshwork to try and get this canal working again. Okay. Um, and then once we've done that, I'm going all the way around 360 degrees. Okay. We're now going to use our eye track catheter because if the trabecular meshwork has been stuck to the iris, the likelihood is that the outflow system is dysfunctional. And, the, and, the, and so what we're doing is we're going to rejuvenate the outflow system by putting this catheter in. And the catheter injects a viscoelastic at high pressure into Schlem's canal, opening up the canal. Okay? Um, it's a bit like doing an angioplasty when you're dealing with, with the, the heart arteries. Now, we've done all of that. That's the end of the operation. And we did this on both eyes. Now, at six months, the prep patient, his vision has improved, and his pressure is eight in one eye and 12 in the other eye, okay? And he's only on monopost and COSOP now. And he's very happy, and his visual fields are stable. Now, he might need glaucoma surgery in the future, but we've actually managed a very complicated case here with a very minimally invasive <coughs> approach. Another operation um, which I think has uh, great power uh, is the, the GAT procedure, something that we introduced to the UK in 2017, and we've got now six years follow-up of some of our patients now. And what you do here is you basically pass a, a, a suture or a catheter all the way around Schlem's canal, and when you pull it inwards, you're basically cleaving through the trabecular meshwork, okay, and allows aqueous humor to get back into the canal over 360 degrees. And there's been a lot of publications over the last three or four years on this. 
But what's interesting is a lot of these glaucoma procedures, if you, if you go back in history, they were described or the concepts were described more than 50 years ago. So Murray and Johnston and Grant, who did a lot of the seminal work on outflow resistance, showed that if you put a suture into the canal and you split the TM like that, because that's what's happening histologically, um, you can increase the outflow fluid, you can reduce the outflow facility. So let's look at an example of a, of a patient. So this is a patient who literally pitched up to our eye casualty with blurred vision, and he was found to have pressures of 60 in both eyes. So this is juvenile open angle glaucoma. It's a blinding condition, it needs surgery. We put him on maximal treatment, and his pressure settled at around 40. He needs an operation. These are his visual fields. So that's the, uh, that's the right left eye, that's the right eye. Now, if we look at the histology of this condition, um, people who have taken trabeculectomy uh, specimens um, in the past have shown that if this is Schlem's canal and this is the uh, trabecular meshwork cell, you have this increased deposition of matrix under the Schlem's canal endothelial cell. And we believe that this is what increases the resistance to outflow. So the disease in this patient is in the trabecular meshwork. So if you treat the trabecular meshwork, you should be able to treat the disease. So this is what we did for the patient. So we're going in with our um, catheter again. We open up a Schlem's canal with an MVR blade, and we go all the way around with the catheter. You can see the blinky light coming all the way around. And then what we're going to do is grasp the catheter, pull it inwards towards us. And as, as we do that, we open up the trabecular meshwork. And we do that all the way around. You can see that little cleft that's opened up, OK? Um, and that's what, what we did on this patient, both eyes, OK? And just to give you an, just to show you, this is what his result is at five years. His pressure is 12 in both eyes on, on a, single, a couple of uh, drops with stable visual function. That was his visual field in 2017. That's five years later. So, you know, most surgeons in the past would have managed this uh, child, uh, child, he was a child, with trabeculectomy. And trabeculectomy in juvenile glaucoma is very complicated, has a high risk of complications. With this gentleman, I saw him, in fact, I saw him last week. He's still stable. And the longer he can remain stable, the better. Okay, ideally, we don't want to operate on him for another five or, t or 10 years. Um, I was going to talk about angle closure as well, but I've run out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Slides. I promise you, get your slides much more than once next time, so you can iron out, iron out these issues. Next, we're going to have uh, Ms. Sai, who's going to talk about uh, Radar. Radar. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I hope people are still awake. So I'm going to try and speak to you about red eye, how to improve assessment and the referral to eye casualty for the patients who need to, because some you can actually uh, treat in, eye, in, in the community and do not need to refer to eye casualty. I'm sure the juniors would like that. <laughs> so the aim of this talk is really to be able to differentiate between major causes of red eye and to know what's side threatening, which will require referral or urgent treatment, and what is not. I'm going to touch up on blunt and sharp tumor, and I also speak a bit about chemical burn. So when a patient presents to you with a red eye, you want to really ask yourself, is this a hemorrhage or a congestion? And if it is a congestion, is it localized or generalized? And if it is generalized, is it mainly more in the periphery, conjunctival congestion, or around the cornea, ciliary congestion? So if it is a hemorrhage, then the subconjunctival hemorrhage also, same thing, it's not showing. So this is a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Usually the patient wakes up from sleep and they find that they've got a red eye, they get quite uh, uh, worried, they come to eye casualty or come to the optician. Now, it's very important to notice that the posterior edge of this hemorrhage is, is apparent. So you want to really ask your patient three questions. Have they had any trauma? Are they on blood thinners? and are they are, are on blood pressure tablets. If they are on blood thinners, you really need to inform the GP because just as they can get a subconjunctival hemorrhage, they can get hemorrhage elsewhere in the body, so the GP needs to tweak their medications. Similarly with blood pressure, sometimes the blood pressure is raised during the night, so they may not be very well controlled. They may need to change their blood pressure medication to control uh, the blood pressure, especially if this is repeated 
and uh, otherwise you tell the patient nothing to worry about it will go by itself and some people just have friable blood vessels and they will keep uh, having repeated subconjunctival hemorrhage now it's a very different than retrobulbar hemorrhage which is one of the absolute emergencies in ophthalmology there are two absolute emergencies and retrobulbar hemorrhage is one of them so in these patients the, that patient you cannot see the edge of the hemorrhage just the, in, the hemorrhage under the conjunctiva you cannot see the posterior edge of it and this patient is not going to present to you by waking up in the from sleep and looking like that they usually come in a major car accident or uh, after facial maxillofacial surgery major trauma and the, the, there is other signs that you should look to for so that like docked visual acuity proptosis restricted eye movement raised pressure sluggish pupil and this is a really really an emergency so what you really need to do in these patients is lateral canthotomy and if you are uh, in a setup where for example in, in a and &E, then we just open up the lateral canthus to allow the blood not to collect behind the globe and cause compression of the optic nerve and major blood vessels and if you've done it and the patient doesn't need it it's not the end of the world we can always suture back the lids but if you don't do it and the patient needs it, then they can really lose vision in a very short span of time. This is just to show you the example of subconjunctival hemorrhage and a localized congestion where the blood vessels are localizedly dilated in a, lo in a certain area. Localized congestion can be due to episcleritis, scleritis, or a form of conjunctivitis, which is allergic called flectinular conjunctivitis. Generalized congestion is caused by conjunctivitis, whatever the cause, or any corneal problems, uveitis, and acute angle closure glaucoma. This is an example <coughs> of a localized congestion, and this is an example of a generalized congestion so that you can see the difference. <coughs> so episcleritis, patients usually present with pain and tenderness. It's usually not very severe, comes and goes. And very important test is to put a drop of phenylephrine in ten percent. Ask the patient to wait outside for twenty minutes. Patient comes back, and if this all is blanched, then this is episcleritis. Very different from scleritis. The pain is much, much more. Can wake up the patient from sleep. A lot of tenderness on the eye, and it can come also with nodular form. Like if there is a nodule, you'll see the blood vessel is kinked on top of the nodule. So these patients uh, uh, have to be investigated because a lot of the times they be, may be associated with autoimmune diseases, and they are treated with uh, NSAIDs, but most likely they <coughs> may require systemic steroids to control it. Now, flectinular conjunctivitis is an allergic reaction to either staph exotoxin or TB exotoxin, and they come as little nodules on the sclera with localized congestion. They can also come on the, uh, on, on the limbus like this, most commonly in children, and treated by topical steroids. Now, what if you have a generalized congestion? You need to ask yourself a very important question. Where is the redness? Is it mainly peripheral on the con we call this conjunctival congestion, or is it around the cornea, which we call ciliary congestion? So conjunctival congestion is predominantly in the phonesis. It is superficial. The vessels are superficial, blanching, uh, branching, and the, the color is bright. And you put a vasodilator phenylephrine because these are superficial vessels, they will blanch. So this is an example of conjunctival congestion. And if you look in the back of the lid, you can see that redness mainly comes to the back of the lid. Very different than ciliary congestion. The vessels are deep radial uh, because uh, they are from the anterior ciliary vessels. They are dusky in colors, and they don't blanch if you put a topical vaso uh, a vasoconstrictor. Can you see here? This is very different, uh, and that's ciliary congestion. Now, conjunctival, conjunctival congestion, we said, is caused by conjunctivitis. Be it, uh, there are so many different uh, reasons for conjunctivitis. The most common is allergic, viral, by adenoviral, or bacterial. Bacterial is very easy to exclude. So you ask the patient when you woke up in the morning with the eyes stuck together with a yellow-green discharge, and if they say yes, that's your bacterial conjunctivitis diagnosed. You just give them topical antibiotics, and usually like to keep it for two weeks, even if the patients, uh, after one week, they are feeling better and with no discharge. Viral and allergic is a bit sometimes different, uh, difficult to differentiate because in both the uh, cases, the discharge is watery. 
However, the allergic patients will come with itching and uh, rubbing their eyes, while the viral patients will come with very sore eyes. Uh, both of them uh, have watery discharge, and the difference really is between uh, the appearance the, the, in the adenoviral conjunctivitis, you'll see these follicles mainly in the lower lids, and they are pale in color with redness around them, around the base, and that's because uh, there is congestion. However, the uh, uh, allergic patients will come with large papillae, flat-topped, much bigger, mainly uh, seen in the upper eyelids, and they are reddish because they've got blood vessels inside them, and there is scarring around them, and that scarring gives the whiteness, so exactly opposite to the viral. The viral patients will also have a, a pathognomonic feature, which is an enlarged tender preauricular lymph node. So for the viral patients, you give just reassurance, uh, lubricating eye drops, uh, tell them it will go away by itself, but stay away from everybody because it's highly contagious. If there are corneal signs, then you may need uh, some steroids, but you don't want to give steroids to every patient because if it delays also the healing. But the, the allergic patients usually need topical steroids and sometimes they need injection of subtarsal steroids if it's very chronic and uh, you've got very big papillae. Now, this is another form of conjunctivitis, which is a neonatal conjunctivitis. And you can see the yellow-green discharge and a lot of uh, conjunctival congestion. When you get uh, bacterial conjunctivitis in very young children, you probably need to give them IV antibiotics because they are unwell, uh, they may be lethargic, they may have fever, so they really need to be referred and treated promptly. Now, chlamydial conjunctivitis is another form of conjunctivitis, uh, which happens in young sexually active males and females. And the pathognomonic sign of that is that it is usually unilateral. And if you give topical steroids to these patients, it, they don't respond. So that's why uh, it's very important to diagnose. And we've got the swabs usually in eye casualty, and they will respond very well to doxycycline or azithromycin tablets. The patient and the partner both need treatment, and you uh, need to inform the GUM team. Differential diagnosis of red eye is the, uh, um, the, the teresiums or diffuse keratoconjunctival proliferations where you can see redness, and the redness is not because of an acute condition, but it is of a chronic condition and with the fibrovascular growth on the surface of the eye rather than uh, congestion of the vessels uh, in the uh, conjunctiva and episcleral tissue. So ciliary congestion. Ciliary congestion can be caused by anything on the cornea, for example, if on body on the cornea. So you really have to respect the patient's symptoms. So if a patient comes and tells you something went into my eye, you really have to examine the eye very carefully. And if you don't see a foreign body, don't, uh, you've got to really look for one. And you have to put fluorescein. And if you see these scratch marks, then do look for the foreign body and don't forget to turn the lids because the foreign body can be right on the back of the lids, like in this patient. Quite often missed in eye casualty. Now, corneal trauma, a lot of children playing together, father and child playing together. Quite often we see a laceration. Very important to stand for with fluorescein, and we do give them antibiotics to guard against infection, although there is not actually an infection. We can get a very nasty bug. Uh, bugs can cause a lot of infection in the cornea, and these patients actually have to be admitted and treated intensively with intensive antibiotics. We have to keep, keep a very uh, close watch on these patients, and they all have ciliary congestion, as you can see here. Viral conjunctivitis can be caused by herpes simplex or herpes zoster, and they have these dendritic patterns, so a patient presents with a zoster, uh, shingles like this one and complaints from the eye, don't forget to put uh, some fluorescein and check the cornea. Now, uh, the other cause of ciliary congestion is uh, iritis, so different signs of iritis, KPs, which you can see with your slit lamps. Now, if you've got chronic iritis or very, uh, uh, very severe iritis, you'll get this fistoon pupil because the iris actually sticks to the lens and you try and dilate the pupil. The pupil is not dilated like a circle because it's attached at these points to the lens behind and you get these pictures and that tells you that the patients had iritis or have severe iritis which require intensive treatment with topical uh, steroids and sometimes you give them subconjunctival steroids and dilating drops. Now the, the third cause of ciliary congestion is acute angle closure glaucoma and that is the second absolute emergency in ophthalmology. Patients present with headache, nausea, vomiting, reduced vision and halos, 
red eye and the cornea is edematous and hazy and the very very pathognomonic feature is the fixed dilated pupil and that's because of the iris ischemia unfortunately that does not recover and the patients will end up with a fixed dilated pupil uh, forever um, these patients you really have to call the on-call team wake the registrar up uh, put a cannula and they have to be given IV diamox or, acid, uh, or uh, given IV mannitol to lower the pressure enough for the cornea to clear. Once the cornea clears, then uh, you can do a laser aerodotomy in that eye and also in the other eye because the other eye is also probably is predisposed. Uh, and once the pressure, don't let the patient go home until the pressure is controlled. We really sometimes... Uh, you say you give them a treatment and send them home. I don't think that's good practice. You really have to manage, admit the patient, manage, and do the laser before you can send them home. So uh, this is just to sum up. So red eye is either a hemorrhage or a congestion. Congestion either localized, caused by episcleritis, scleritis, or flectinular conjunctivitis. Generalized can be caused by conjunctivitis. Uh, and there are so many different forms of conjunctivitis, but uh, if it's conjunctival congestion, it's conjunctivitis. Ciliac, conge ciliac congestion can be caused by anything on the cornea, uh, contact lens, uh, foreign body, or laceration, or infection on the keratitis, or inflammation inside the eye, uveitis, or acute angle closure glaucoma. So all the causes of ciliary congestion are potentially site-threatening. So if you see a patient with ciliary congestion, send the patient to eye casualty. So I'm not gonna go through the cases, I'm just gonna uh, touch up a bit about uh, trauma. So trauma assessment is very important. Uh, so you really, if a patient comes with trauma, you really have to assess uh, every aspect uh, of the eye, look at the lids, evert them, look at for any particulate matter, Check the conjunctiva, is there a hemorrhage, is there a laceration? Sometimes conjunctival hemorrhage can mask a globe rupture, so that's very important, or can mask a foreign body. So uh, if it's a sharp trauma, you really have to do an x-ray for these patients because you can miss a foreign body. Uh, corneal abrasion, look for foreign bodies, laceration, ischemia. Check the AC for cells, hyphema. Uh, pupil may be dilated with mid rises from the trauma. Uh, do I dilate the pupil and check for vitreous hemorrhage? Check the fundus. Uh, optic disc trauma does not usually uh, give you optic atrophy straight away. It takes time to cause that, but you can also get retinal hemorrhages or uh, commotion retiny or even a retinal detachment. These are examples of the foreign bodies. Uh, then again, on the cornea or on the back of the lid. Now, what about uh, blunt trauma? can be used uh, due to tennis ball injury, the eye is painful and red, you might find hyphema, like in this patient. Very, very important to bring the patient regularly to check the pressure, because if the pressure uh, rises about, about uh, above a certain level, then you have to go and evacuate this hyphema. Now, other things that you can get with trauma is corneal abrasion. Um, you have to cover these patients with topical antibiotics four times a day and review again in 48 hours to check that the patient's getting better. Now, penetrating injury is usually caused by a sharp injury. You can get probably an iris prolapse or a corneal laceration. Very important sign is the peaked pupil. So be very, very um, very very proactive if you see a peaked pupil because that means that you've got a penetrating injury these patients have to have tetanus toxoid if they've not had one uh, recently they have to have systemic antibiotics and you try and uh, send them for surgery as soon as possible i don't know the video the so these this is an example of a of, of the sharp trauma causing the peaking of the pupil and sometimes it won't be that obvious because you've got hemorrhage you've got subconjunctival hemorrhage and it can be more at the limbus but the peaked pupil is what gives away this is another child with uh, with a uh, with a penetrating injury which was repaired actually in 24 hours however the, ch the child still developed late onset endophthalmitis so that's just to tell you how important if you can do it in the same day it's much better uh, than, than waiting. Now, just a touch on chemical burn. So, chemical burn can, the worst is caused by alkali being fertilizers, drain cleaners, or plasters, uh, or cement, 
or even household cleaners. So that causes uh, sub that causes hydrophilic and lipophilic degeneration of the tissue, and that's why it penetrates deeper and deeper, and that's why it gives the worst prognosis. Acids, on the other hand, uh, such as car battery or bleaches or swimming pool disinfectants, causes coagulative necrosis of the tissue, and that's the 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 acid binds to the corneal tissue and that prevents further penetration. That's why the prognosis of acid uh, injury is better than alkali burn injury. Alcohol usually just causes an ulceration on the surface. So chemical burn represent about 11 to 20 percent of ocular trauma. Young males have two thirds of the cases and alkali burn is about two thirds. Industrial accidents and home accidents and assaults are the problem. Uh, about uh, 1,500 assaults cases a year is being documented, which is really, really very high. And the patients have the symptoms come with pain, photophobia, blepharospasm, lacrimation, visual impairment. Uh, the first aid measure is really very important to irrigate. Now, because the eye is very painful, if you do not put an anesthetic, then they will be closing their eyes and the irrigation will not go in. So very, very important to put an anesthetic before you irrigate and you get probably with one liter of saline uh, and then check the pH before and check the pH after irrigation. And remember if there are any debris, uh, then that can continue to create problems and cause uh, further damage to the eye. So you have to try and double avert the lids and remove any particulate matters and then recheck the patient again after 10 minutes to make sure that the pressure is seven. Um, and then there are other measures to reduce the, uh, to change the pH, such as paracentesis, uh, which we very, very rarely do, or uh, injecting buffered uh, phosphate solution into the AC, which I don't think I've seen that have uh, done. But it's very, very important to double erode the lids, as we can see here. And then to assess the patients, and there is uh, many different, uh, a couple of different uh, gradings. So the better one, obviously, the dual classification for grading of chemical burns, because it doesn't only take the cornea into consideration, but also the conjunctival staining. Uh, and uh, you have to check the patients and document exactly how much of the cornea is stained and how much of the conjunctiva is stained. And remember, you can, a patient can look like that and you think there is no problem at all, but you have to put 2% fluorescein and wait and look for the staining because for that, that, although that looks not too bad, but if you stain, you'll find he's got complete limbal ischemia and absolute uh, complete loss of epithelium. And this patient's actually ended up with very, very bad uh, results. It's very important to check the pressure uh, it can be low if you have got ciliary shutdown, or can be raised if you have got trabecular damage, uh, but very important to check. And sometimes you can only check with your hands because uh, you can't, the surface, is, the patient can't even open their eyes. How do we manage the patients? We give them preservative free steroids four times a day, uh, antiproteases to uh, uh, prevent the melting, sodium citrate six times a day is probably. Now the ascorbate <coughs> level in the AC becomes less, so you have to give them oral ascorbate, so oral vitamin C, one to, uh, to two grams per day. You have to cover with broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, use cycloplegic, to, and remember not to use phenylephrine because already they've got ischemia and you don't want a vasoconstrictor. And anti-glaucoma, you want to probably use oral diamox, uh, not topical medications, uh, because oh, you don't want to bombard the eye with so many uh, eye drops, which will be toxic to the surface. Uh, and then again, surgical intervention usually is late, uh, except if the patient is not healing, you can put potential amniotic membrane. If, and if the whole ocular surface is affected, you can potentially put an amniotic membrane with a conformer and do a tarsophy to cover uh, everything uh, and let the eye settle uh, and but otherwise um, treatment to uh, restore vision usually not before 18 months from the chemical burn such as uh, conjunctival grafts, stem cell transplantation, all of these are late managements. The hidden phases of ocular burns are uh, uh, bad and can have a devastating outcome and this is one of our very, very bad uh, patients who's had chemi severe uh, alkali burn, and he unfortunately lost both eyes. 
although we tried everything for him. So to sum up, we need to recognize the side-threatening causes of red eye, and any patient with celiac congestion need to be referred to eye casualty. Uh, superficial cornea abrasion could be potentially treated with topical antibiotic with primary care, but do bring the patient back and make sure that it's getting better. Uh, trauma, you have to refer, depending on the visual acuity and the mechanism of action. Uh, chemical burn, think of irrigation, irrigation, irrigation. Thank you. Any questions? We'll do the questions after that. Any questions at all? Questions? So at the end, we will be asking you questions. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dalia. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dalia, for the presentation. I can apologize once again for the slides. Um, so we've got a break for coffee now. We got like 45 minutes for coffee. So we'll encourage you or urge you to spend time with our sponsors who are eager to meet you all. So we're going to reconvene, say, a quarter to four. So let's get back in that quarter to four. So it's a good 45 minute coffee break now. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about another very uh, important subject um, that is often overlooked in um, glaucoma clinics. Um, and that is the ocular surface. So the ocular surface is a very complex uh, organ system um, which uh, is comprised of multiple units. So you've got the lacrimal gland, uh, you've got um, the uh, mucosal system, which protects uh, from an immune perspective. You've got the conjunctival epithelium, the corneal epithelium. You've got the eyelids at the front as well. And then you've got the various defense mechanisms, including the mechanical ones, uh, but also the uh, biochemical ones. Another very important uh, component of the ocular surface is the limbal stem shell uh, cell niche, which uh, repopulates the corneal epithelium. And all of these can be damaged by glaucoma medication. So when you look at an eye like this, unfortunately, we, we see this too often. Um, particularly, these are not, my patients generally look like this. But often when I'll get patients from colleagues and from, uh, I'll see patients for second opinions, they come in with red eyes, painful eyes, um, but they're always told by their treating doctor that your pressure's great. Well, for me, this is not controlled glaucoma. Controlled glaucoma is when the pressure is great, but also the patient has a good quality of life. They can see they're not in pain, they're not in discomfort. So that is what controlled glaucoma actually is. And, you know, we know all of these medications that we use uh, to treat glaucoma, but actually, if you look at all of the clinics uh, in, 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 an, in an ophthalmic unit, the prevalence of glaucoma in your of, uh, ocular surface disease in a glaucoma clinic is probably the highest. So the, some of the studies have looked at this. You've got a third of people have severe OS, uh, OSDI scores, um, with, if you look in total, probably about 70% of patients will have some degree of ocular surface disease. Some will be symptomatic, some will be asymptomatic. The importance is that even if someone is asymptomatic with ocular surface disease, that you take um, an active um, sort of role in trying to improve that because it will have implications for that patient's glaucoma surgery going forward. Now, one of the culprits is this molecule here. This is benzalkonium chloride, and there's lots of data to show that benzalkonium chloride uh, is not good for the surface of the eye. Uh, this is just the percentage of patients Who's OA and the OSDI score, and as you increase the number of back-containing eye drops, the OSDI score increases. Back from a biological perspective, destroys cell membranes, um, uh, promotes the secretion of inflammatory mediators, and it's quite a potent molecule. Um, in a rabbit study, they showed that it's retained on the ocular surface a single drop after 168 hours. Now, the other thing is that it's not just back, but even the even the glaucoma drops, the medications themselves have biological effects. So um, HLA-DR, uh, which is a, a pro-inflammatory molecule expressed by dendritic cells, it, it's more highly expressed in patients who are on timolol preservative free versus controls, and similarly with latanoprost. So that shows you that the molecules themselves will also have a toxic effect. 
And so this is a patient um, who's had a trabeculectomy in one eye and the, in the other eye, they're still using glaucoma medication. And you can see there's a stark difference in the appearance of the corneal epithelium. And it's just to sort of highlight how toxic these drugs can, can be. A glaucoma-related ocular surface disease can blind. So you can develop cicatricial disease as a result of glaucoma medication. And you can also develop stem cell deficiency as a result of uh, prolonged exposure to back. So this is a patient who came to see me from abroad. Uh, one eye completely vascularized cornea and the other eye significant stem cell damage uh, because of glaucoma medication. And she's got a, quite a complex and protracted history and had some surgery in, in, in London, had some surgery in, in Pakistan. But basically, she has been damaged by years and years of toxic benzalkonium chloride containing glaucoma drops and that all of that could have been avoided. Now if you look biologically what happens to conjunctival tissue when you expose uh, that tissue to back, uh, this is normal. So you have a normal architecture here. In, in this row here you've got patients who are on two back containing glaucoma meds. So you've got disruption of this, the epithelium, this is, these are goblet cells, so you get a reduction in goblet cell density, and this is a conjunctival uh, substantia propria, you get a dis uh, disruption of the architecture there as well. And if you look histologically, um, again you can see this is normal, this is uh, those exposed to drops, and you can see there's a disrupted architecture, and you get increased expression of pro-inflammatory mediators in green here, this is Vimentin. Now, goblet cells are very important for the health of the ocular surface. Uh, they secrete ocular surface mucoproteins, but they're very sensitive to the damaging effect of glaucoma meds. The loss of goblet cells causes dry eye inflammation and fibrosis. And studies, again, in rabbits have shown that even one month of um, topical back-containing medication can cause a 70% reduction in goblet cells. The stroma is also affected. Uh, you get fibroblast proliferation and activation, connective tissue deposition, and increased sickness of subepithelial collagen. Now, there isn't very much written about tenons. It's been my clinical observation that prostaglandin analogs particularly cause the tenon tissue to melt away. Now, what is the impact of these medications on surgery? Now, we use uh, the conjunctiva. Uh, it's sort of the hallowed ground for us to do glaucoma filtering surgery, but these medications damage the ocular surface, they damage the conjunctiva. And so, and we've known this for many years. These are studies from the, uh, the, the mid-90s which show that basically the more glaucoma medication you're on, the less successful your operation is. So these are patients who had primary surgery, um, they've got a good success rate uh, out to 100 months. Those that have had, uh, that have been on three or four medic back containing medications, the success rate is much, much worse. So we know already that prolonged use of topical glaucoma medications adversely affect surgical outcomes. And the duration of medications is also important. So again, this shows you duration of medication exposure less than three years. This is greater than three years. There seems to be a, a big difference, again, in terms of trabeculectomy success rates. And again, study after study has shown this. This is a study which, again, looked at the number of back-containing medications versus, versus success rate. And those patients who had the highest number of back-containing medications, uh, as indicated by this line here, have a, a fall-off in their uh, uh, success rate very quickly. So another thing that I call the elephant in the room, um, this is a patient on, on bimataprost, okay? Bimataprost is a good drug at lowering IOP, but it's very, very bad for the ocular surface, okay? Um, it's now off, um, you know, off license, so I think it's, it's basically be, uh, being manufactured by lots of different, or it's off patent, so lots of different companies are, are manufacturing bimataprost. Um, but this is what bimataprost does to your eyes. You, the eyes basically sink backwards into the eye sockets, and this makes glaucoma surgery extremely challenging, okay? Um, and what I found is these patients also develop a, almost a secondary hydraulic glaucoma, where because the orbital tissue has become so tight, whatever operation you try, it, 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 the success rate is very, very low. And again, there is now data to support these. These are recent studies which show that your trabeculectomy success rate depends on the prostaglandin analog that the patient has been on prior to surgery. So this is latanoprost, this is bimataprost. You can see there's a huge difference in the success rate. 
And this is another study which looked at the PAP score. So the PAP score is the degree to which the eyes have sunken in um, before surgery. So again, if your PAP score is zero, so that's not a very sunken eye, versus a very sunken eye, the outcomes are very different. So this is very recent data from 2022. So we now are seeing the data to support this, uh, this notion that bromatoprost isn't a, not a good drug. I think all prostaglandins have issues, but, but bromatoprost by far is the worst. Now, uh, this is a, a, a confocal showing the improvement in the uh, subbasal nerve fiber uh, layer um, following institution of uh, ocular surface improvement measures. So we can see functional changes on the corneal um, confocal. Now, what can we do as glaucoma specialists to um, avoid these problems? Well, identify patients who are appropriate for early filtering surgery at the outset. So patients who present with advanced glaucoma, increasingly the TAG study, which uh, was run by Tony King in Nottingham, uh, basically has, has shown us that patients who present with advanced glaucoma should really have early surgery. And I look for things like this, high IOP, young patient, a lot of disc damage, those patients need early filtering surgery and should certainly be treated on with preservative free medication early on. Those who tolerate medicines poorly and consider a MIGS procedure or a microinvasive procedure early on. And I always say that avoid BAK in patients likely to need a, a filtering operation early on. So if I do see patients whose ocular surface isn't great, um, then what do I do? I discontinue the back, free medic the back medications will switch to preservative free. Often I will stop the medications altogether, including lubricants. Sometimes you see patients coming in on 15, 20, 30 drops a day. They've been put on three or four glaucoma meds, then they've developed ocular surface disease. They've been put on multiple lubricants, steroids, and et cetera, so, and I've seen all of this. And then they develop a marginal keratitis because they now have got myobromian gland dysfunction as well. Again, prostaglandin analogs can cause MGD. So what I do in these patients is I'll stop all of the medications and I'll put them on oral acetazolamide. Um, and then if you leave them on oral, oral acetazolamide for a little while, you can then get their ocular surface improved and then you can think about surgery. Consider topical steroids. Uh, something like softacort is very good. I use Icurvis very liberally as well in these patients. Um, and then preserve to free lubricants where you can. Oral doxycycline, another very good drug to use. Um, it inhibits MMPs and down regulates some of the pro-inflammatory mediators. And this is just to show you the use of topical cyclosporin to control OSD in patients with uh, chronic glaucoma-related OSD. And you can see that uh, post-cyclosporin um, treatment, the Shermer's test is better, the tear film breakup time is better as well, and the ocular surface disease index scores are also improved. So topical Icurvis is actually quite a good drug to use when you're trying to treat um, patients with glaucoma-related uh, ocular surface disease. I think the other big uh, advance has been uh, the use of minimally invasive glaucoma surgical procedures. So we know with trabecular microbypass um, surgery, we can get the aqueous humor back into the canal um, and we can get patients off medication, and that helps to improve ocular surface disease. And we have good data now from randomized controlled trials, um, and the eye stent inject is the first uh, MIGS device which has shown uh, a durable effect on vision-related quality of life. And what they showed in their study was that basically in terms of general vision, ocular pain, and driving ease of driving, patients who had cataract surgery and a stent and therefore were on less medication uh, were more likely to report uh, the fact that they were able to uh, drive or, or, or enjoy life um, in, in general without problems. And again, significant improvements in OSDI scores, tear film breakup time increased by 49% and reduced corneal and conjunctival staining and less hyperemia. And these are all reflections of the fact that patients are on less medication. And this just again just shows you uh, what happened. M most of these patients, if you like, were in the severe category and a lot of them moved across to normal or mild OSD. So likely the primary factor that contributes to the improvement of the ocular surface is the significant reduction in medication. So increasingly, if, if a patient is due to undergo cataract surgery, they're on medications for glaucoma, I always now say you should consider a MIGS procedure, whether it's an eye stent or a hydrus or something like that, to help the patient reduce their medication load. We now have evidence as well, as I've said earlier, that um, 
patients whose IOP is, is uh, um, controlled without medications tend to progress less when you look at data over a number of years. Um, this is a very interesting paper. Uh, this was published probably about five or six years ago by a colleague of mine from Birmingham, and he looked at what the attitudes of glaucoma specialists were on the preoperative management of the ocular surface prior to trabeculectomy. And I have to say the findings were interesting because almost 50% of glaucoma specialists didn't really do much about the ocular surface prior to trabeculectomy unless they thought the patient was symptomatic or the eyes were very red. So uh, some of the sort of uh, key take-homes from this paper, so preoperative optimization of the ocular surface was seen necessary by 48.4% of specialists and beneficial. So necessary, less than 50% of glaucoma, and these are glaucoma specialists. So obviously people who do not uh, specialize in glaucoma and are not going to be operating on these patients, they're even less likely to, to be concerned. So, But we've known about these things for, for, for 25 years. So still, unfortunately, people uh, are not... Um, you know, uh, actioning these things in their clinics. So again, what do I do? Liberal use of preservative-free medications, early use of SLT. I've given you data in my previous talk that SLT is very beneficial in terms of lowering pressure um, and pre preventing uh, the, the need for further filtering surgery. Avoid bimatoprost. Uh, early appropriate surgery. The question I asked you in my earlier talk is minus four on, on the mean deviation score, really early glaucoma when you've lost 60% of your ganglion cells. And I think patients who present with high pressure with disc damage, it's, this is surgical disease. You should not be medicating them for a long time, particularly if they're young, you should think about early surgery. So this is a, just a very short video to show you what happens to the conjunctival tissue when you've been on eye drops for a long time. And it just this is me trying to do a trabeculectomy on this patient. You can see how thin and diaphanous the conjunctiva here is. There's hardly any tenons left. And what we have to do here is we have to bulk up the, the remaining little bit of tenons with, with uh, an injection of BSS into the subconjunctival space. Uh, tenons acts as a sponge, and so it sort of um, hydrates up. Uh, but you can see that we, what we've got here We've got a conjunctival tear here because, again, the tissues are very thin. Uh, again, another patient where the tissues are very, very thin. Again, patients have been on eye drops for a long time. So it's really important from my perspective that I am mindful of these things because I'm going to be looking after this patient over their lifetime, and all of these uh, subtleties or, or small things make a difference. The other thing uh, you know, people are increasingly thinking about is, are drops actually causing disease progression? So uh, this uh, study from um, Badouin's group in France, who's, who's a big, um, uh, big uh, chap in the area of glau glaucoma and OSD, what he's shown is that benzalkonium chloride can actually be toxic to trabecular meshwork cells. It can get into the eye, and it can cause further trabecular meshwork damage. And the other question I've, all, I, I've thought about is, do drops damage the distal outflow pathway? So this is a neoprene cast of Schlem's canal. Okay, imagine the cornea is sitting here. And you've got all of these distal outflow channels which are sitting on the ocular surface. So if the ocular surface gets damaged, it is conceivable that the outflow system is getting damaged because of that reason. And again, my colleague uh, from Birmingham, Mr. Mohammed, did this very interesting study. Uh, he just looked at five or six patients. This was published in the Journal of Glaucoma. These were patients with uncontrolled glaucoma and ocular surface disease. And all he did was he controlled the ocular surface. He gave them preservative-free medication, lubricants, and doxycycline. And at 24 months, none of these patients who had quite uncontrolled IOP needed further surgery. So you can get OSD-induced glaucoma almost. So if you treat the OSD, the IOP will also improve. And this just shows you what happened to these patients in terms of their IOP control. I'm just going to skip through that. Okay. So here's an example of a case where we've used uh, a MIGS procedure to uh, basically improve the ocular surface. Um, this is a patient um, who uh, came to me with high pressures on all of the toxic medications, so Ganfort, Brinzolamide, and Bromonidine. Um, his uh, ocular surface was horrendous. He had early lens opacity. His pressure was 25 on all of that concoction. His eye looked like this. This was his visual field. So he's got a paracentral defect in one eye, and in the other eye, the field is full. Now, the question I would ask glaucoma specialists is, what are you going to do in this situation? Are you going to do bilateral trabs? Well, they might work, but you'll have to needle like hell, uh, and they may not work. 
would you do bilateral tubes? Okay, I chose a slightly different approach. So um, this is what we did. So we started off by first taking out his lens because he had an early lens capacity, and I always believe in patients once they're over the age of 60, if you need to take the lens out to manage the glaucoma, take the lens out. It's, 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 it renders future surgery, filtering surgery or tube surgery much, much easier. So let's just flip through his cataract operation. Um, again, what we did here, um, and what I tend to do in, in, in some of these patients who have very high pressure, is I tend to do the, uh, the GAT procedure. So uh, we use our MVR blade to make a tiny little opening in the uh, trabecular meshwork within Schlem's canal, uh, check that we're in the right, right space. Uh, you can see the posterior wall of Schlem's canal there. Then we use uh, these micro forceps to again guide the catheter into, uh, into the canal, pass it all the way around, do the same thing as I showed you earlier in my, in my you can see the, the little light coming around here. We do the uh, a GAT procedure again on this patient. And again, look, this patient is four years post-op. He's had both eyes done. Uh, his pressure is 14 on no treatment. His eyes are white. And if he does need future trabeculectomy, he'll get a, get a very good result. So some of these patients do very well with these mixed procedures. I'll give you another example of a case. So this is an 86-year-old man who came to see me for a second opinion. Again, very advanced glaucoma, bilateral dense cataracts. He's on a lot of treatment. Uh, you can tell that people were not to keep too keen on operating on him. He's SLT, he's at diode. He's very depressed, vision's 675 left, hand motion's right. Now, left eye, this is his better eye. This is the field in his better eye, okay? And that's all he's got left. And I can understand why people would be reluctant to operate on him. In these kind of patients, I often do a Goldman field. The Goldman field shows us that he's got some functional vision there. So we went ahead and, and, and did surgery on him. So this is a, a combined cataract and um, stent procedure. Um, so um, that's the cataract part. And then I'll just show you the, the stent part coming up here. Okay, so we get the gonio lens. We have a look at the angle. Um, and these micro stents are basically on a, um, a preloaded trocar. So you can just press a button on the delivery system and it'll deliver the stent. And you can see the stents have gone in and there's blood reflux, which normally shows that there is good uh, connection with the distal outflow. And when we inflate the eye, you can see blanching. So that, all, that red area all blanched as the, as the BSS went through the stents into the canal and into the distal outflow. Now, again, um, let's look at the outcome. So he's six months post-op. His vision's improved from 675 to 615. His IOP is stable at 10. I've managed to get him off his Dimox and his Ramonidine, and he's now on preservative free triple therapy with a much improved ocular surface. So another great result using MIGS rather than anything more complicated. Now, if we look at trabeculectomy surgery, so the other issue is once you've done a trabeculectomy, what, do you, what, what happens to the ocular surface, okay? So the ocular surface can be affected in patients who've had trabeculectomy surgery because you've obviously got a bleb under your eyelid that can disrupt the ocular surface. So I will always tell patients who've had glaucoma filtering surgery to use lubricants regularly because that helps to keep the comfort of the eye. Now, it's been shown that goblet cells, again, this goes back to the issue of when you oper if you operate on people who've lost all their goblet cells, then the, the chance of your trabeculectomy being uh, successful is less because the number of goblet cells you have, and this is uh, highlighted in green here, the number of goblet cells you have predicts sometimes the success of your, your glaucoma surgery. So this is a patient who's had a successful operation um, with lots of goblet cells visible. This is someone whose operation is scarred and there's less goblet cells visible here. And a functioning trabeculectomy uh, drains via various routes through the conjunctiva, through the, 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 vein, the, the veins, and transepithelial via goblet cells. And so again, this is showing you these goblet cells uh, using in vivo confocal. These are, uh, again, critical to the success of glaucoma surgery. So in terms of how do we prevent trabeculectomy failure, um, I, I do think there's still uh, surgeons who are delaying surgery um, because, you know, patients have normal vision. People don't want to operate. A glaucoma operation can make things worse. So there is often reluctance to operate and people are just over-medicating. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Um, I think you need to do timely surgery in the appropriate patient and treat OSD aggressively. Obviously, meticulous surgery ensure that post-operatively that the OSD is well-managed. 
Now, one of the other big elephants in the room is that if you look at the big trials, 50% of TRABs fail at five years. And the question is, why? And I think one of the issues is appropriate, timely, early surgery. I think the other issue is that once you've done your trabeculectomy, you still have to be mindful of managing the ocular surface. Because if the ocular surface gets injected red and you've got MGD again, all of those inflammatory mediators will conspire to make your bleb scar and your bleb fail. So I don't think people focus as much on the uh, management of the ocular surface after trabeculectomy surgery. I'm talking about two or three years down the line. They think that everything's going to be okay, but it isn't. And sometimes these patients need long-term, weak topical steroids. Um, so again, I will use softer court from time to time, particularly if I see someone's ocular surface getting worse or the bleb becoming more injected. That's a warning sign. Um, I will also use lubricants, as I've said, but also cyclosporins. So some patients I will keep on Icurvis. So just to summarize then, OSD is a ubiquitous problem in glaucoma clinics. Uh, there is a real impact on quality of life for patients and the outcomes of glaucoma filtering surgery. We do now have a plethora of options available to optimize the OSD, uh, both medically and surgically. And I think understanding the glaucoma uh, and its treatments uh, and, and the side effects of medications is very important. And you need to have an individualized approach uh, to manage these patients and to optimize the quality of life and pre prevent blindness. Thank you very much. I think that's a great question. I think the, the answer, the reality of that answer is that m a number of patients will be okay on preserved medication, okay? Some, some patients will be okay. And I think Zalatan, for example, the original Zalatan was a very good drug. I think Latanoprost as a molecule is a good molecule. And certainly um, Monopost, for example, that I use is a, very, is a, is a good drug. Um, I have found that some patients react very badly to preservatives, others, their eyes actually look pretty good. So I wouldn't switch everyone, but some of the points I've made is young patients likely to need an operation. If you've got an 80-year-old patient who presents with a pressure of 25, 26, I think latanoprost preserved is absolutely fine, providing their ocular surface is okay and it doesn't get worse. So I'm not saying you should hold, I mean, I think the, the utopia would be switch everyone to preservative-free. But in reality, in terms of cost and all those other issues, I think that I would select the patients that you use preservative free on, um, because they are those drugs can sometimes be more be more expensive. Should we at least convert the ones we plan in surgery on? D definitely. For, for a while, maybe a month or two. Or, or longer. Okay. So if you see someone who might need surgery within the next year, you're kind of doing a bit of SLT. You're looking at them. I would certainly switch them to preservative free. Absolutely. But again, like I said, those where you think they might need surgery within the next five years, again, think about putting them on preservative-free right at the beginning. But also, SLT, as I've, you know, the SLT data is very good. I think any new patient with raised pressure should, have, should get an SLT as first line. Any other questions? Just to follow up on the question, can you make a case for maybe as a first line, I mean, now that we see the shift happening from drops to SLT, maybe that shift this, the shift may well go towards that. Um, the, other, the other thing that's very exciting is depot uh, intraocular drug delivery. So a company, Glaucos, which make the eye stent, are coming up with something called the eye dose, which in trials has been shown to be quite successful. It's a little implant that goes into the angle and eludes Travaprost over a period of two years and can maintain IOP control in about 80% of patients without a need for additional medication. I think ultimately the data is now showing that if we can control pressure without medication, we get better disease stability. So I think that's the way that things are, oh, so glaucoma is becoming more interventional basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now the big sp uh, space is so crowded. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, no, no, I know, we're going off piece, but I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm very clear. I think the problem, the, the issue is that, that, that there are lots of competitors and everyone says they're 
devices for mild to moderate disease. And you can use the devices in mild, moderate disease, all of them. But the reality is each of the devices have a different risk-benefit profile and uh, risk of complications. So that generally, if you ask me which is the least invasive device out there, it is the eye stent. Then you've got the hydrus, then you've got things like uh, the canaloplasty, where you, where you have to pass the catheter around. You can get back bleeding, you can get decimase detachments. So, so there are issues you can get with some of the catheter-based procedures. So what I tend to do is I look at what the risk for that patient is, how high the pressure is. So one of the things I do look at is if the pressure is 35 or 40, and I want to do a canal procedure, let's say the disc is normal, um, then I will go for something like a GAT because I know I can access more of the outflow system. So in my own, my own mind, I've got an algorithm now that I use um, uh, with respect to which MIGs you should use where. Yeah. Oh, hi, Ron. I just want a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one, um, you said that you're happy to use MIGs as a way of stopping the drops. Yes. Uh, and if that works, that's great. But if they then need TRAB, yeah. what's... Do we have enough experience of failure rates in trams when patients have had MIGs yeah. done three, four years ago? Yeah, yeah. And we're quite confident it's quite it's better than if you hadn't stopped the drops. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think the impact of the drops is quite significant. Having an implant in the eye or, ha or having done a GAT uh, doesn't really affect the eye in terms of the outcome of trabeculectomy. And in fact, um, you know, one of the concepts that, again, I talk about now is patients with advanced glaucoma who've got a cataract in the old days, there used to be this debate constantly, do you do a FACO or a TRAB or a FACO TRAB? I think from my perspective, that debate has been kicked into touch because you can do a FACO mix procedure and you can do a TRAB a year later. And I've done a number of those and this idea that I call bridge to trabeculectomy. Um, and the TRABs work very well because ultimately it's the medication affecting the ocular surface that are the key culprits in terms of TRAB failure. Okay, thanks. I've got one, one last question, if yeah. I may. Um, if in patients with advanced glaucoma, like the patient you described, yeah. uh, where you did, I think, the, the MIGS Mix, procedure, yes. and you did, they did pretty well. Yeah. What's, so the thing that patient, I think you said your colleagues or some people yeah. have not operated on for quite some time and yeah. left them on drops and et cetera, et cetera, presumably because of the fear of catastrophic visual loss with yes. surgery. So yes. the question is, with the MIGS or FACO MIGS yeah. or just MIGS, yeah. what's the incidence of catastrophic visual loss in patients like this with advanced glaucoma, okay. especially on the eye? Yeah, that's a very good question. There's no data on this because the uh, generally the devices are licensed for mild to moderate disease. And most of the sort of in most of the industry and most of the <coughs> studies are on mild to moderate disease to try and get people off medication. This is something that I have to say, I'm one of a lone voice pushing this. Um, and I've seen the results. We are now starting to collect our data and we want to publish this. But I think the um, the catastrophic this patient was at risk of catastrophic visual loss. So you have to do a number of things, like for example, you, when you give them a subtenons block, small volume block, you don't put too you do the surgery quickly. Uh, what I found with the stents was that stents buffer post-operative pressure spikes. So you're much less likely in a glaucoma patient when you do FACO plus a mix procedure to get a post-op spike, and that really I think is one of the keys to preventing visual loss in patients with advanced glaucoma undergoing cataract surgery. Oh, thank you, Mr. Masood. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, Ms. Saeed talk about dry eyes. Okay, I'm just going to speak to you about uh, dry eyes um, briefly. Obviously, you can't cover dry eyes in a short time. But anyway, the epidemiology, you know, the incidence of dry eyes is about 20% in 10 years in the age group, 48 to 90%. The prevalence is about 5 to 50, more like 50 than 5. It is more common in females, especially the postmenopausal females, most common in a Asian ethnicity. And the economic burden uh, and impact of dry eye on vision, quality of life, work, productivity, psychological, physical impact of the pain, uh, and considerably, particularly cost due to the reduced work uh, productivity. So it's quite a huge economic burden of dry eye on the community. What do patients come and complain about? They complain about dryness, discomfort, blurriness, grittiness. 
um, the dust in the eye, sand in the eye, chili powder in the eye. So are all these different symptoms or are they actually a different expression of the same symptom? Uh, they also complain of pain, tearing and watering, although they have got dryness, and that's usually associated with allergic patients and viral patients. Uh, itchiness, especially if they've got blepharitis or allergic eye disease. And a lot of them complain of visual disturbances, a reduced vision, uh, and they keep going to the optometrist to try and change glasses, but actually you've got to treat the ocular surface before you change any glasses. Uh, you have to also ask the patient about any environmental factors, such especially what other things are worse if they're in air-conditioned area or in the car heating or they do a lot of air travel or they use hair dryers or computers. And uh, ask about systemic association, especially dry mouth, dry um, nose and joint pain, skin problems, uh, nodules, and obviously ask about any drug history because a lot of drugs will influence the dry eyes, especially antihistamines and tricyclic antidepressants and a load of other drugs which will increase the patient's dryness. So the, the, the new definition of dry eyes which we're following up so far according to the DUS2 classification is that dry eye is actually a multifactorial disease and uh, of the ocular surface and characterized by home loss of homeostasis of the tear films. There are four important points uh, in that uh, associated with tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, inflammation, and nerve damage. So all of these four factors play an important role in the dry eye disease. So if you think about it, is dry eye due to old age similar to dry eye due to menopause, similar to dry eye to laser surgery, to dry eye in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis? Are all these, are we talking about the same disease here or are they all different diseases? They are actually very different diseases. So what do you do when you have a patient with dry eye? First, you start with your triage and quest questions. How severe is the patient discomfort? Um, do they have any mouth dryness? Uh, is the vision affected? So there are quite a few questionnaires which you can use in your triaging questions. Then ask about other risk factors, such as smoking, uh, certain medications, what are the medications, L contact lens wear, how long are they wearing their contact lenses. Then once you've done that, then you go to your diagnostic test. So your symptomatology gives you a scoring, then you go into diagnostic uh, tests and you have to go with that order. First, the non-invasive tear breakup time. So if the tear breakup time is less than 10, then you go to osmolarity testing and there are kits specifically for osmolarity testing. So if the osmolarity is more than 308 or there's a difference between both eyes, then, then that qualifies into the, have them having dry eye. Then you stain go to ocular surface staining with fluorescein, you can stain the cornea, you can stain the cornea and the conjunctiva with lichen and greed. Then you, uh, you diagnose your dry eye, whether it is evaporative, mainly due to abnormality of the lipid component of your tear films, or due to reduced secretions or aqueous deficiency dry eye. And often there is quite an overlap and most patients will have a little bit of both. So the Delphi panel have classified dry eyes into dry eyes with lid margin disease, dry eyes without lid margin disease, and uh, dry eyes with altered tear distribution. And each of them, they uh, are classified in severity from one to four. So altered tear distribution, you, you have to examine the lids and examine the conjunctiva clearly before you do your tests. So these patients with conjunctivitis or uh, fat herniation, you, you will see with these patients that although they might have a high tear meniscus, but they're still complaining of dry eye because patients with conjunctivitis where they will have the conjunctiva bunching between the lids and that will cause a lot of irritations. They, it will cause uh, the tear film does not flow normally on the uh, ocular surface and these patients will become a lot symptomatic and probably they will need to have removal of excision of their conjunctivitis to improve their symptoms. Uh, also the patient, you examine the lids for blepharitis, whether anterior blepharitis, if you've got squamous or ulcerative blepharitis, or you've got posterior blepharitis and various degrees of posterior blepharitis. So you have to really express uh, for every patient, you've got to look for the 
until you befight this with an ulcerative or squamous, then you've got to try and express the meibomian gland by very firm pressure on the posterior, uh, so on the eyelids to check for posterior blepharitis on all aspects of the lids up and down to check how much posterior blepharitis they've got. And then you stain the patient. So you put fluorescein and check for S superficial punctate keratitis, check the conjunctival staining. There is also grading for the staining of the conjunctiva. And, and then you, with uh, your corneal staining, you, you have to know that there is superficial punctate keratitis can be localized and can be diffused, and they can be fine, and they can be coarse, and um, they can be interpalpable or inferior, and that is different than if they are all around. So inferior punctate keratitis or interpalpable can be seen with incomplete blink reflex, uh, while patients with more severe dry eye will have uh, diffuse staining uh, and post LASIK dry eyes, the staining will be mainly central. So it's quite variable and different in, in patients presenting with dry eye due to different causes. That's why we're saying it's not one disease, it's multiple diseases which come under a spectrum, which come under a certain uh, diagnosis. Now, filamentary keratitis, uh, the filaments actually happen because the desiccated uh, epithelium then attracts mucus, and then these come like a filament, and it's very, very painful because the nerves are exposed, and every time the patient blinks, it is very painful, and that usually happens in patients who are have associated uh, systemic diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Now, these patients, you've got to really use a forceps and pick up the filament and actually from the base and create a little ulcer to get rid of the filament, then we put them on an acetylcysteine long-term to treat uh, these patients. Now, the other uh, sort of end of the spectrum is the neurotrophic uh, keratopathy. And these patients uh, can happen after many, many diseases. Most common is the hepatic eye disease or if they've had neurosurgery, and they get uh, this uh, non-healing epithelial defects, uh, which are quite tricky to treat, and that is a, uh, a talk, another talk in a different day. Uh, and then, again, the last end of the spectrum is the patients with keratinization, uh, like the patients with Steven Johnson's and ocular scatitial pemphigoids. And how do you know that the patient's got keratinization? Uh, if you put the fluorescein, you'll find that the fluorescein will form these little bubbles uh, and they don't diffuse normally, then you know that patient has got keratinization, or they can also uh, have non-healing epithelial defects with rolled edges, and that is, again, a sign of neurotrophic, neurotrophic keratopathy. So where is your patient on the spectrum? The patient's got pain without stain, so a lot of symptoms, uh, pain with stain, so he's got a lot of symptoms and a lot of signs. The patient can have stain without pain, so these patients are probably neurotrophic or have hypostasia. You've got to test the corneal sensation, which is very important. Patients who've got pain without stain, are, these are the most difficult patients to treat because they've got severe pain. Some, some of them are actually suicidal, and they come and spend an hour in the clinic, and you look and examine everything, and there is nothing there. But if you do a confocal microscopy, you will see a lot of changes in these patients. You'll see these hyperreflective neuroma, uh, and which can be spindle uh, or lateral or stump neuromas. Uh, and we, then these are very difficult to treat, but some of them actually we give them uh, off the shelf just uh, uh, anesthetic medications. But if you're giving anesthetic, medic uh, anesthetic two to three times a day, you have got to also cover them with antibiotics because the sensation is gone. So uh, how do we manage dry eye? We first triage, start by triage questions, then check the risk factors, then do your diagnostic test in the order, then you classify them into evaporative and aqueous deficiency, and, uh, and then we treat them in a stepwise manner. So what are the steps? Step one, you have got to really educate your patient about the condition and its management and the prognosis and, and ask them to modify their local environment. I've asked patients before to change the uh, uh, profession because they're sitting all day in an air-conditioned office and that doesn't help the dry eyes or, or, or they're moving houses and then everything flares up because of the dust. And then also you can uh, educate them about their dietary uh, requirements and especially if they've got uh, lipid deficiency, she dry eyes, then they have to have oral essential fatty acid supplement. Uh, also, 
and you have got to check the, if they've got uh, any systemic associations and check if they are on uh, preservative uh, medications, especially preservative uh, glaucoma medications. And then you can uh, start putting them on various ocular lubricants and uh, ask them to do lid hygiene. Now, your artificial teardrops is, should really always be preservative-free. Nobody actually is recommending any any artificial drops with preservatives. Um, then the next step is to give them an ointment at night, make sure you've, they're doing their lid hygiene, and there are other uh, dry eye drops which will have extra uh, components to them which uh, maintains the ocular surface for a longer period of time Then they don't have to put the drops um, on like hourly medications. So once you've done your non-preservative ocular lubricants, uh, then if the patient's got Dermodex, they, that has to be treated with Teotriola. How do you diagnose Dermodex? You actually find like a collar it along the lash. And then if you can take a one lash and send it to the lab, they can actually diagnose the Dermodex. And uh, very important to treat with tea tree oils. And there are certain products in the market which have wipes which is containing uh, tea tree oil. Or they can get just two drops of tea tree oil diluted uh, with water in a well and use that with a cotton bud to rub the lashes very firmly once a day. Not too much. It has to be this diluted because otherwise it's very irritant. And then you can use moist chambers uh, um, and use ointment that's nice. And then there are in-office uh, procedures which can be done uh, to help the dry eyes and uh, such as so first you start with your eye bags, uh, which can maintain the heat for 10 minutes. Uh, you heat them in the microwave and put them on the eyes. There is also a blepharsteam, which uh, gives heat and also gives uh, moist. Uh, there is also the lippy flow, when, and the lippy flow will, co will cause uh, heat to the inner aspect of the eyelids, and it will cause mechanical stimulation of the outer aspect of the eyelids to milk the uh, glands. There's also the uh, Blefax, uh, which is another device to exfoliate the, the edge of the lashes so that uh, if they, you have mybomian glands which are blocked, then that can uh, be uh, removed, that block. And then there is the IPL system, which uh, kills the Demodex. Um, and also it can, uh, or, um, if you have telangiectatic vessels, then it gets absorbed. The heat gets absorbed, uh, the laser gets absorbed by the, um, the hemoglobin in the blood vessels, and that will close these telangiectatic vessels. So various techniques can be used in office to treat dry eyes. Now also you need to give some topical antibiotic or a topical uh, antibiotic steroid combination, obviously preservative-free, to treat any uh, lid margin disease or anterior blepharitis. Uh, if you're going to give steroids, I will give strong steroid for a short period of time. So usually I give a patient maybe dexafree four times a day for a week, twice a day for a week, then very gradually reduce to something uh, softer such as um, softer coat or any other uh, softer uh, that does uh, uh, steroid which does not uh, penetrate the lid margin. Then uh, we start usually to give them uh, um, topical non-steroid immune suppression, uh, such as cyclosporin. We use this quite often in the dry eye clinic, and we tend to start the steroids together with the, um, the with the icovis or cyclosporin because the icovis and cyclosporin take about four to six weeks to kick in. So you want to start it together with the steroid, so the steroid will cause the uh, control acutely and uh, while your cyclosporin is building up in the tissue to f long term for long term control of your patient um, and then also if they've got my uh, or maybe rosacea or my bombing gland disease then you need to put them on tetracyclines now your step uh, step three would be oral secretagogues, uh, which improves the mucin uh, concentration, autologous serum, but uh, remember you should not use autologous serum if the patient has got uh, autoimmune diseases such as ocular secretial pemphigoids in these patients. If you've got to have, give serum, you need to give uh, allogenic serum. And then uh, there is your bandage contact lenses, and uh, uh, whether soft or rigid gas permeable lenses, if you've got a neurotrophic ulcer, uh, and then again, the topical steroids is your step four, but not long term. And in some patients will require amniotic membrane grafts. Uh, and if you put plugs and the patient is better and the plugs keep falling, then you can actually surgically occlude the punctum. Uh, some patients with neurotrophic ulcer will require a 
or where the extreme cases may require a salivary gland transplantation. So these are examples of plugs. So there are these collagen plugs which dissolve in two weeks. So you might want to try these first if you have access to them. And if the patient feels better, then you can put a punctal plug which is synthetic. The plugs can be punctal or canalicular. The punctal club will sit on the punctum and you can see it. So if it falls, you know it's fallen. But the canalicular plugs, uh, so this is an example of a punctal plug on the surface. But the canalicular plug does not appear on the surface. So you've got to write in your notes that you put up a canalicular plug. Obviously, the canalicular plug, if you put, it becomes very difficult to get it out. Uh, so you've got to be wary of that and just put in the notes uh, that there is a canalicular plug inserted. So the tips for dry eye treatment is that uh, patients with adequate uh, reflex tearings are unlikely to develop a problem. So if the patient's got to watch the patient and look for blink reflex. Uh, symptoms worse than the sign, or there is no sign but the patient is complaining, treat the patient. Signs mild but no symptoms, you can watch and beware obviously of the cornea sensation. So that's something very important to examine in all your dry eye patients. If you've got signs significant but there is no symptoms, obviously you treat. So if you've got SPKs, you've got to treat. And beware of any concomitant medications, especially if they are glaucoma patients on anti-glaucoma medications, then you, you have to remember as from the previous talk that, that this can cause a lot of dryness and you have to manage that with preservative-free medications or surgery. Thank you. Yes. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the pain without stain, you said that you give them local anesthetics to go home with. Um, yes. Um, what about the fact that the, some of these patients have a psychological overlay? Do you involve a pain clinic and use oral uh, medication like they sometimes give amitriptyline or gabapentin or things like that? So these are a very, very different group of patients. They're, they're called allodynia. So they've got uh, a lot of pain and absolutely nothing. We do everything. So we test them first. We put a drop of anesthetic in clinic and see if their symptoms improve or not. If their symptoms improve, then they are likely to improve with the topical anesthetic treatment. And if their symptoms do not improve, then they, that the same pain is probably central now. So these patients are hypersensitive to pain, which normal person will not uh, feel. So a draft will cause them pain, while a normal person will not have pain with the draft. So uh, this hyper, and, then, and these patients start essentially by by being peripheral pain, but eventually because they've had it for a long time, then it starts to become central. So the brain is the problem, and these patients, then we refer them to pain clinics, and we work with the pain clinics. Uh, they give them a lot of different things and, um, to, to reduce their sensation of pain. These do not respond. If it becomes central, they don't respond to the topical anesthetic. And if we give the topical anesthetic, we've got to give antibiotic with it. And we tell them not more than three days, uh, three times a day. And we tell them that this is off-license use for the, for the treatment. So if you give them the topical anesthetic early on, before it becomes central, is that a good, that's a good yes, thing? Yes, I've it? had patients yeah. who, are, for example, a patient who used to sit in her, in, all in her house with very dark goggles because she just cannot tolerate any light stimulation. Then we gave her this topical anesthetic, and then she was able to eventually take off the dark goggles, at least at home, and function a little bit with these. But you have to follow them carefully, because remember, you're making them a little bit neurotrophic, and then you're trying to break the cycle, actually. You're trying to break the cycle of pain so that they are not hypersensitive, and some of them do improve. Can I just comment on that? Yeah. I, I think the, the, the message to take home is not everybody goes and starts prescribing anesthetic drops. Yeah, absolutely. The, this absolutely. is under extremely controlled situations. Yeah. You really have to scare the life out of the patient saying, if you overuse, you can perforate and lose your sight completely. Remember, these patients have good vision. You have to scare them and then say that we are only trying to break this pain cycle and the effect only will last for a few minutes or a few hours, then the pain will come back. But don't keep using it, use it only twice a day, uh, and then we give it, you know, give them the minims and only give them two or three minims so they cannot use it for a long period of time. So it is completely off license, but it wasn't 
uh, us that started this because the refractive surgeons, many of them give local anesthetic for a day or two after less, uh, PRK surgery uh, because it's extremely painful. So it hasn't had any serious adverse events. So that is, that is where we do this. And I have a patient who had pain starts in the inner corner, then spreads to become full-blown trigeminal neuralgia, and she's a patient of Stephen Johnson syndrome. And then she has to sit for a long time in, in the dark and treat her headache. So she's a school teacher in Cambridge, and she comes all the way for a follow-up. So I told her, here's this anesthetic. You are an intelligent lady. Next time this pain starts in the corner, you put a drop of anesthetic. And believe me, now it's been one and a half years, and she never gets that full-blown uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Just you snip it in the bud with the anesthetic drop. So there are very specific indications to treat pain with administration of local anesthesia, but not as a routine. Sorry, just one more question. Um, um, what, what about the role of vitamin D? Because there's quite a lot about vitamin D and dry eye, and certainly I give vitamin D to a lot of patients. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think also that's a very good supplement to have. Uh, a lot of uh, reports are, are now coming up about the importance of vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency in, in, in dry eyes. So definitely I would recommend that. Yeah, but if you look at the UK population, everybody has low vitamin D. Yeah, but not everybody has dry eyes. <laughs> so it's going to help in more than one way. Yeah. And if you have got poor vitamin D, you probably have other nutritional deficiency, but specifically vitamin D, I mean, yours, mine, you go and check it, it'll be low. You rarely get exposure to the sun. And that's why it's a good idea to take. Many doctors uh, advise you just take a supplement of 20,000 international units once a week, which is what I do, and you keep it. But it's not because I have dry eye. But it, your general well-being is head and your dry eyes also better. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, thank you, Dalia. So we're just moving on to our last talk of the day, which will be complications of corneal surgery by Prof. So what I'm going to tell you is uh, two things. You will see a lot of things in primary care or in eye casualty or as training doctors, which you may not know what's going on when they are related to corneal surgery. So if you understand the surgery that is done, then it will make sense and then also little tips on how to recognize those things and what you can do in the primary care sector and what you need to refer. These are my declarations of interest. So I'm going to cover, I've got these four things listed, but I will just go on till my time runs out and I'll keep an eye on my time. So the bulk of the talk will deal with cornea transplants because that's the bulk of the corneal surgery we do in Nottingham. And there are different types of cornea transplants. For more than 100 years, there was only one type called full thickness cornea transplant. No matter where the disease is in the cornea, you take the whole cornea out and you put a new one in and had 16 stitches at least. But now we moved on to lamellar surgery where you treat only the layer that is affected because it has a lot of advantages. So if the stroma is involved, like in scars, like in dystrophies or like in keratoconus, then you replace only the stroma, leave, leave the endothelium behind, so you get no risk of failure due to endothelial rejection. It's a huge advantage because the commonest cause of a regraft is failed previous graft. In fact, the commonest cause of a graft today, the commonest indication is a failed previous graft. So that's called deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. You retain the patient's endothelium, but the rest is exactly the same. You still need those 16 stitches long recovery period and astigmatism and distortion of the graft. Endothelial keratoplasty, where the endothelium is affected, the rest is normal. There you just replace the endothelium. And there are three ways you can do it, with a bit of stroma, with just the pre layer and the endothelium, or with the endothelial desmids membrane only. So when it is with a bit of stroma, it's called desmids stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty, <coughs> or DSEC. When it is with the pre layer and endothelium, it's called PDEC, and with the desmis membrane endothelium only, it's called DMEC. The advantage here is that 
you're only replacing the endothelium. The risk of rejection is lower than a penetrating graft, but there are no sutures, and the recovery is within three weeks because the cornea is the patient's original, the curvature has not changed. It's a very rapid recovery, but the operations are more challenging. Now, this is full thickness cornea transplant. So you will see the whole cornea disc is being held with the forceps. This is the first suture going in, and, and then we, we do it. Nowadays, this indication has dropped. It is not the commonest operation we do, but for certain pathologies where all the layers are affected, there's a dense scar through and through, there's acute hydrops after keratoconus or a failed previous graft, then we have to do this full thickness cornea transplant. So what happens, depending on the surgeon preference, you may have different kinds of sutures. So you can see over here, these are the 16 interrupted sutures there. Here's interrupted, 12 interrupted, and a running suture. So you can have only running, only interrupted, or mixed. But this is what the patient can come to you with. They can have <coughs> epithelial defects, loose or broken stitches, rejection, infection, recurrence of the original disease, and vascularization. So one looks out for all of these, and you will see them, and in the context of a graft, they become important. So a loose or broken stitch usually traps mucus, and there is a concentrated fluorescein stain around it. The first very important clue. The second is... It acts as a windscreen wiper, this broken stitch that is sticking out, and with each blink it moves, but because the radius is fixed, it can swivel around and make a nice complete circle, as you see over there, uh, that circle, or it may be a half circle. This was the olden days when virgin silk instead of nylon was used, and that is, is nowadays not used, but uh, classic examples of, of very loose sutures attracting a lot of blood vessels and causing uh, um, a, almost the graft to fail or reject. Here again, loose stitches attracting blood vessels and trapping mucus. Mucus traps polymorphs. Polymorphs cause erosion because of the proteases and also cause uh, inflammation. Here's another classic of that circle that you see. So when you put fluorescein and you see that circle, look for a loose stitch or a broken stitch because sometimes the stitch has decolorized over time. Uh, they usually break around 18 months following surgery uh, and they become white. So you don't see them easily, but if you put fluorescein and you see a circle, then look for it and you might see this little stitch in the middle. All you have to do is grab it with the forceps and pull it out with topical anesthesia on the slit lamp, which is what we do. If you can do it, fine, do it. Uh, even as a nurse, you can do it. But if not, then send the patient promptly for that to be removed because a loose or broken stitch can cause infection and or rejection. So very, very serious complications. Here's another example of the same. Now, rejection has many different manifestations, and one has to look carefully at the cornea to pick them up. You can reject the epithelium, you can reject the stroma, you can reject the endothelium, or a combination of these layers. So what you see with the epithelium rejection is a line like that, and a bit of haze. So this line is the key, and you will see this line again over here, and if you see the patient, one day the line is here, the next day it will move. So it's a migrating line. But the most important point is it stains with fluorescein. So you put a drop of fluorescein. If that line stains, then you know this is epithelial rejection. The eye will be a bit of red, bit, show a bit of redness. The patient will be photophobic. Uh, moving on to stromal rejection, one of the common manifestations is this. This is like adenoviral keratitis. You get these numular opacities in the stroma, quite discrete from each other. It is not adenoviral because you will see it only in the graft. In adenoviral, you will see in the graft and the host, but rejection will not occur in the host, only in the graft. So you see these little spots like that, then it's rejection. They are called Cratchmer spots, and they are anterior stromal Bowman, sub Bowman's layer uh, kind of uh, infiltrates. Um, then if you have vascularization of the cornea, you can get edema of the cornea and a lot of inflammation, uh, then that is true stromal rejection, which you rarely see in the absence of blood vessels. Usually when blood vessels are there, they're usually deep blood vessels. Uh, here's another example of those adenoviral type lesions, but you see them only in the cornea and not in the whole stream, like I said. Now, if you see a line like this, and I just told you that's epithelial rejection, 
but on the slit lamp carefully you will see it's not on the epithelium it's in the endothelium but more importantly it will not stain with fluorescein because it's inside on the endothelium and when you see a line like that which is not staining and this line will also advance and that is endothelial rejection this part of the cornea peripheral to that line will be edematous because the endothelial cells have been destroyed and it's swelling and then that as this migrates across the cornea starts getting more and more edematous that line is made up of series of keratic precipitates little cells that have deposited cytotoxic cells remember i said type 4 reaction cell mediated immunity which is destroying the endothelium the difference from an epithelial rejection is that the epithelial rejection recovers because the host epithelium grows on and it goes back to normal. The endothelial rejection, the host endothelium does not grow back on, the graft fades. Uh, so the problem with an epithelial rejection is if not treated, it can trigger an endothelial rejection. Therefore, they have to be both treated equally aggressively. And here's another very nice example. This is a slide uh, that uh, Dahlia took a picture of one of her patients in Cairo. You can see the little dots are the keratic precipitates and that's the, um, the edema of the graft peripheral to that advancing line. And occasionally, of course, the endothelium and the cornea don't always follow the rules. Uh, there can be spattering of keratic precipitates but all on the graft only. So iridocyclitis, you get keratic precipitates but you get it all over the host and the donor cornea. Uh, you will get it on, but in rejection, it will only be the donor cornea, like those numular opacities. So again, it tells you this is not hydrocyclitis. And it's very severe and acute, then the whole graft will become edematous. So when you see all these kinds of funny changes happening in a cornea graft, immediately refer, because think rejection unless proved otherwise. So what else? Infection, usually related to a broken stitch, but can occur otherwise also and it's quite devastating because it can cause the graft to fail and or can spread inside and cause endophthalmitis. So again, recognition of bacterial corneal ulcer just like in any other case, but here in the context of the patient also having a corneal graft. Now, viral keratitis is interesting. We all see dendritic ulcers beautifully in the center of the cornea, but in a graft, you never see them in the center. Usually they occur at the graft host junction. Remember, you've cut all the nerves. And the, the virus is in the trigeminal ganglion, so it's coming down the, the axons and the shedding of the virus from the axon is at the graft host junction because that's where the nerves are trying to grow back into the new cornea. So you get this dendritic staining lesion at the graft host junction and that's what tells you that this is most likely to be a viral infection like you see over here. And the original disease like granular dystrophy for which you did the graft uh, will come back in the new cornea over time. So it depends on how long after you see. But the difference particularly for granular is that the time we do the graft is through full thickness of the cornea. But when it recurs, it's usually superficial. It starts with the epithelium, starts working its way down into the stroma. And if all is well, the total donor epithelium will be replaced by the host epithelium in one year. After which, the host epithelium, which carries the defective gene, will start producing the same protein, abnormal protein, which will deposit as granular. So these are some examples where there are superficial recurrences of uh, what was originally a full stromal involvement of granular dystrophy. Epithelial defects and vascularization is common. Now, some of these patients when, they, when you do a full thickness graft or even a deep anterior lamellar graft, the cornea is a bit warped. Astigmatism is there, vision is not good with glasses, so they give them contact lenses, give them very good vision. Then they don't want to take the lens off. They wear them for 20 hours, 18 hours a day, and that causes hypoxia and vessels to grow. And what you'll see quite interestingly is that this patient with a contact lens with overwear, the vessels will grow back along your suture tracks primarily. That's the first preference vessel group because the collagen tissue of the suture tract and of the graft host junction uh, uh, is more vulnerable to protease digestion by the vessels and they offer the path of least resistance. And you can see here it's illustrated well that the contact lens in but the vessels are growing along the suture tract. They will reach the graft host junction and then they can spread along there or they may go straight in over there. And the problem is that uh, these are not good because they cause inflammation but in a deep lamellar graft they do not induce endothelial rejection. They can induce stromal rejection, 
which is better treatable than endothelial rejection. And then you get extensive vascularization or extensive edema, and that's pretty late stage uh, corneal graft rejection. So all these are the different manifestation, different spectrum of rejection. Now let's look at this operation. What you've done is you've injected air in the cornea, a bubble has been created, then you take the top of the cornea off, and the bubble is still intact, then you puncture the bubble and you cut the remaining bit of the cornea off. So you leave behind what originally was thought to be only the desmus membrane. And this was called the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty until we showed that it's not the desmus membrane, it's this new layer of the cornea, uh, which now has been well proven to be the case. So we're leaving behind the pre layer, the desmus membrane and the endothelium. The pre layer is very tough. It, doesn't allow the eye to rupture with little trauma like a penetrating graft might, but that's the operation of deep anterior laminar keratoplasty. And just to show you this in a, in, a, in, a, in a human eye bank eye, if you create that bubble, so the eye is upside down, we've created the bubble, you can peel off the entire desmus membrane, but the bubble remains intact. So that's this other layer which was missed for many years until we reported it from Nottingham and, and wrote many papers on this. But that's the histology of that layer. You can see the endothelium desmus has been removed, but a thin layer exists, which is the big bubble that is created by the injection of air. Now, how is this different? You can get epithelial rejection, but you cannot get endothelial rejection. So the same thing, you see that line which is staining, and this one does not increase the risk of endothelial rejection because the endothelium is the patient's own. So you can be uh, a little more lax. You don't have to refer the patient the same hour to the hospital. You can call, the, call them and say, oh, get, get there within 24 hours or something because we can treat this. If you know that the patient has a deep anterior lamellar graft, but the sutures will look exactly the same. Now, sometimes you get these interesting features which were previously never seen. So you have, imagine a keratoconus, so a large amount of desmus membrane, large cornea because it's ectatic. Now you take the top off, but you still got that lax desmus membrane and the pre layers layer is also stretched. Now you're squashing it all back with a normal shaped cornea. So you get a lot of these striae or these folds or these concentric rings. And these are redundant desmus membrane, greater surface area being squashed in, they show you these wrinkles, they're of no consequence, they iron out over time, they don't affect vision, they don't need to be treated. But don't think that this, they look like the sands of Sahara, and it says, oh dear, you have gone in drop. So, let me just dismiss. Rejoin. You gonna let me in? Now it's me, they have to share this again. Uh, maybe just go to PowerPoint then. I should have done that in the beginning, I told you, <laughs> right when I came. Uh, should I just? Yeah, you've lost the internet connection. Yeah, I need to do with that. Oh, yeah, it has lost. Why did I lose it? Because this Radisson Blue only lets you uh, do it for a short period of time. Share. Yeah. It won't start from the beginning, will it? Because <laughs> often they do that. So, is that okay? I, I, ah, I have to share it from yes. here, right? Yeah. Ah, this one. Yeah. Perfect. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next time it stops, we call it today, right? <laughs> so that's. It looks like for those who've seen refractive surgery patients with LASIK looks like sands of Sahara, you know, those little bumps, okay. but it's not, because it's, it's something. So just to know what it is rather, and not get uh, overexcited. Now, it's not moving forward. Are you sure it's, ah, there we go. Now often this shouldn't happen, but it happens that in the interface you will see things that look like KPs, but it's not. So this was a patient with deep lamellar graft, and you see that little bit of stuff there on slit peel. There's a bit of your swab tip that has has uh, broken off and has been trapped. It was, you, you wash it and all that, but sometimes a little bit stays. Now that 
bit is annoying when you see it post-operatively in an operation that's gone well, but it's not a kinetic precipitate. You don't have to go and fish it out, but it, it's there, uh, spoils the aesthetic of your surgery and your ego, but over time, it does shrink. And you can see it became very small over here, but a bit was still there uh, in, in that eye. Now, sometimes, if the patient has a, a not, does not have keratoconus, which is a lot of tissue, but has a flat cornea, like a macular dystrophy, and you put a cornea of normal curvature on it, there's a gap between the predesmis layer, desmis membrane on one hand and the cornea. So there's a gap between the two. So when there's a gap, you have to put air in the eye, and this we do quite often, as you'll see with the endothelial keratoplasty, to push the cornea back against the surface. And whenever there's air in the eye, the pressure can go up very high. And if it's not treated, they get this fixed dilated pupil called the Uritzerallius syndrome, and it doesn't come back because there's ischemic necrosis of the sphincter muscle due to high pressure. And in this patient, the graft was attached back, but the pupil suffered that, and then we had to give a painted contact lens to give her normal vision, but that is completely avoidable. Blood vessels will grow in, and like I said, blood vessels follow suture tracks. They will come across this, uh, along the suture track, but the moment they reach the flat plane between the deep lamellar graft, then they try to spread out as a fan. So again, very interesting, the behavior of signs and the manifestation of signs of behavior vessels has been changed by the anatomical planes we create by our surgical intervention. This is just an example of stromal rejection does occur in deep lamellar keratoplasty. One advantage of this technique is this, this patient, you know, I showed you the one with the vessels, we used to overwear her contact lenses, uh, got an infection, bacterial infection, the graft opened up. So we thought we'll have to treat the infection and then, then uh, put another suture in, but uh, now my pointer isn't working. Ah, here it is. So that dehiscence completely settled and the scar was there once the infection was treated. We didn't have to put a suture because she had a deep lamellar graft. If it was a full thickness graft, there would have been leakage, shallow anterior chamber, and risk of endophthalmitis. So that's another advantage of retaining the pre layer in this operation. Now, moving on to the endothelial keratoplasty, and just to show you what we do. So here, this is the donor eye, not the patient's eye. We're passing a blade to cut at least, if the cornea is 550 microns thick, we want to cut, cut at least 400 of the top off, leaving 150 behind. Then you, this is the top that's been sliced off with this automated keratome. What's left is what we're going to transplant because the endothelium with about 130 microns of the stroma. And this is what's being done. Now just to tell which side is up, this is very gross. This is the first time this was done by uh, a colleague called Dr. Boosin. This is his video. So you put this with the endothelial side, but you want to know which side is up, otherwise it will not work. So you put an F, P, F, and S are the only three alphabets that look right one way. If you put an A, it will look right this way, this way, and a B, and so forth. So you then pull this in the eye, and then you can see if you can see the letter F the correct way. Now over here, we've taken off the patient's disease desmis membrane. We put this in, you tap it into the center, and you inject a bubble of air to push it against. Now the patient goes around for three months seeing a big F. No, he doesn't. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it does dis disappear over time. Now, there's another way of doing this, and this is this pre dismissed endothelial keratoplasty. So this is another operation we invented in Nottingham, and there are some centers who do only this exclusively. We just came back from Chennai, Dali and I, where they do only this, and they do 80 operations a day, uh, all operations including this one. So you create that big bubble, you aspirate the air, and then you refine about seven and a half millimeters of that tissue, which is made of the pre layer, desmis membrane, and endothelium. And this one has an advantage because it's supported by the pre layer, doesn't scroll as much as the desmis membrane. And this is what you then transplant in the patient's eye. And this is uh, the operation itself. So we've created this bubble. And then what you'll see is we're going to cut it on the side, put some vision blue to stain the tissue, you cut it along the circumference, you put it into this cartridge, it always rolls with the endothelial cell outside. So even if you don't have the F mark, by looking at the way it rolls, you can tell which is the right size. You inject it in the patient eye from which the desmis has been removed, 
and you use air and tapping to open it, put air below it. See, this I was telling you about the air in the eye can cause the pressure to go up and, and you have to monitor the pressure and it's back. And then look at this patient, the air is now absorbing. This was the bullous keratopathy for which the operation was done. And when it settles, it becomes absolutely pristine. This was following this PDEC procedure. And again, here the pre and post-op, pre-op, post-op at about one or two months. Now this is the gold standard operation and here you can see what we're going to do is we're going to only peel off the desmus membrane from the donor eye, right? So we peel it off to two thirds, we put it back. Now that F mark here, this is the small F mark with a little stamp, eight millimeter of tissue is cut, the donor uh, desmus membrane is kept aside, the recipient's eye is being prepared, this is the patient's eye, you take out the desmus membrane uh, by making a circumferential nine millimeter scoring and then peeling it off and then you take the this desmus membrane uh, you take it off the disc you put this dye wait for about two or three minutes transfer it into a bowl and then you suck it into this pipette and you inject it in the eye and once it's injected in the eye you then tap it into place to open it and and then put a bubble of air to support it so this tissue is only supported with a bubble of air it can float off. And if a patient walks into your clinic, which my vision is suddenly gone, and you see something blue, this will be blue still in the first two or three days, then you know that this is what has happened. And, and uh, it's nothing else uh, other than uh, uh, the blue stained desmus membrane that has come off, not the man from Mars. So, but when it works, you can see this is the DSEC operation post-op. So it's a little thicker tissue, and this is the DMEC, where only the membrane was transplanted, and you can ha see the difference. That patients usually prefer this to this if they've had one in each eye. So we try not to do two different, or do, do the same one in both eyes is better. And what can you see after these operations? What can go wrong? Again, they can have interface deb debris, as you see those little dots in the top picture over there, the white dots, and you can see at the slit beam, the dot is right at the level of that interface. Uh, between the tissues. You can see a haze, mostly with D6, there's an interface haze that can occur because there's more stroma tissue, the keratocytes can overreact and cause that haze. So this can affect vision, but these are the kind of manifestations that will present to people who look at this for the first time or in the primary care, then you should know what, what you're seeing. Uh, and They can get rejection with the keratic precipitates, as you see, Again, these will be only in the area of the graft. So the, the rejection risk is much less with endothelial keratoplasty, even though you're transplanting endothelium, but it does occur. And this is a graft that has come off. You can see the slit beam showing you, this is the patient's cornea, there's a gap, and then that DSEC graft has not only separated, but it's also sunk to the bottom due to gravity. So if you see that, you know what is happening in this patient, obviously, we could take him back, recenter it, and put some more air, and try and stick it back in place, and hopefully it sticks. Now, where are we for time? So we've got five minutes. Uh, Terigium, I'm not going to tell you much about it, other than the fact that when we do the operation, we have this, we stick it in place with glue, and you take a conjunctival graft from the upper part of the eye, and you stick it back in place with, with glue. Now, that's called an autoconjunctival graft, and you also stick this part back into place. But what happens post-operatively is you get this reperfusion injury. So you will see the, the graft that we've detached from the top has been severed of all the blood vessels. So when you put it here, before new blood vessels grow in, those vessels on the graft have suffered hypoxia. Then they connect to the vessels around, and the blood vessels go into these blood vessels, the blood grows into these blood vessels, which are hypoxic, and they suddenly dilate, and they exude a lot of fluid. And that happens in any organ transplant. It's called reperfusion injury. And then it looks quite dramatic, swollen graft, red graft, but over time it settles. And that's how sometimes it's very hemorrhagic because it bleeds, and the patient comes like, and we warn the patient to be very alarming. It may happen. Don't worry. It will eventually settle. Um, so... Recurrence of pterygium is, of course, a, a more serious complication that we see in some of these patients. Amniotic membrane, we use a lot of this for various reasons. This is the lining of the baby in the womb. It has very good healing qualities, uh, but there are risks of transmitting HIV, hepatitis B, C, human tissue. And one 
donor can give you tissue for many, many recipients. So there's a risk of spreading to many people, different ways in which we use it, but just to show you some example, non-healing defects, uh, you close them with, with amniotic membranes. So here you can see following herpetic eye disease, there's almost a total melt with some blood vessels. So we put two or three pieces in it, then put a larger piece on the top and the cells grow into the membrane and they build up the cornea tissue. As you see in this patient with uh, zoster keratitis, very deep facet in that, you can see how deep it is. We stacked it with amnion and then when all sutures were out, not only has the thickness increased, it's become more or less transplant, uh, transparent with one little bit here that is still opaque. So all these, the kind of things you might see, but sometimes this residual membrane uh, becomes opaque and doesn't dissolve. So you can see this patch of white in the cornea and you wonder what it is. Ask the patient, have you had surgery? He said, yes, he usually will know that we've done a membrane transplant and then you can know what's going on in the cornea over here. Uh, you wait for it to go or you then have to uh, go in and remove that. Uh, it can, membrane can fall off and other things and sometimes ciprofloxacin deposits will all, ciprofloxacin drops that the patient is using and if there's a defect, it will deposit uh, as a whitish band on the cornea. It will also deposit on the amniotic membrane and sometimes the spongy layer of the membrane absorbs water and swells, just like uh, Professor Masood showed you could uh, put BSS in the tenons and cause it to swell. The same tissue, the spongy layer swells. It looks like you've got a double anterior chamber, but you give it a day or two and that will settle. So these are some of the things. You can get hemorrhage with the membrane and so on. So now if you look at cornea like this, a funny looking cornea, that's because a conjunctival graft has been put to heal this defect, which was otherwise not healing. Even the amniotic membrane might not work. Then you make a flap of the conjunctiva, rotate and stitch that into place. That's what you will see. Uh, we'll skip this one. You can close the blood vessels with a fine needle diathermy occlusion, but sometimes the patient comes back with that. So a lot of intracorneal hemorrhage. The patient has had this treatment. Again, you wait, it goes away. Uh, and if there are perforations, we put glue on the eye. And this patient might come to you with a white disc like that and some whitish material on the <coughs> cornea, which is nothing but cyanoacrylate glue that is stuck to the cornea and then it, we leave it there, usually covered with a bandage contact lens. So different manifestations of different little procedures uh, that are going on. If the glue stays for a long time, it will attract blood vessels. So maybe it's time to remove that one, otherwise it can cause more damage. So in summary, patients with recent or past coronal surgery may present to primary care with a wide range of issues, right? Uh, understanding the operation helps you understand what's going on. A good history, asking about any recent or past operation is a very good starting point. So no matter what you see, have you had any operation? Have you had any injury to the eye? Because a, a laceration, which is like a operation, you know, cutting the cornea, might sometimes produce similar kind of manifestations. And clinical signs will vary according to the operation that is performed. Some signs are generic and some specific to the operation. Sutures are the commonest culprit for irritation, inflammation, and infection. So if you see a loose switch, very often, this is so common despite us hammering this point home. You've done a cornea graft today, the patient's gone home, come back for the first follow-up visit, and in eye casualty, they say, oh, there were two sutures loose, but he only had the graft two days ago, we didn't touch them. So no, nonsense. These sutures are not doing anything. They're only a recipe for disaster. Even if it is one day ago, you take them out and you replace them if they have to be replaced, but you don't leave them. And that's the message we drive home to everybody. If you see a loose stitch, no matter where the patient is, primary care, secondary care, eye casualty, that stitch should come off the same day. Otherwise, it can cause serious problems. And corneal graft rejection we've seen has a range of manifestation. Early rejection can save the graft. So we can abort a rejection episode by early treatment, otherwise once its rejection becomes acute and severe and the whole graft is lost, then it's too late. So sometimes uh, just the time of the day makes a difference. And we tell our patient, if you have symptoms of photophobia, lacrimation, blurred vision, in the morning, come in the morning, don't wait till the afternoon. Because if we start steroids straight away, we can save the graft. Don't wait for the afternoon. But that's how urgent and important that is. Thank you.
And please, any questions for any of the speakers? We have half an hour <laughs> for discussion. Yes, so, one second. It's, a, it's going to be a two-way process. We're going to see how much you have understood of all the six talks. Hi. Uh, it, it was about the interface deposits. Um, how long do they usually last, and what symptoms would what they get? It depends on what it is. I mean, if it's a single, if it's a fiber of the drape, it might last forever. If it's nylon, if it is a, a, a material like a, 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 the, the sponge material, it's usually made up of a um, what's it made up of? Of, of, of like a polymer or something. Like if it's a sponge it will last forever. If otherwise, slowly, slowly, the macrophages have to eat it away and it goes and it can take months. And what symptoms would they get? Would it just be glare? No, or they won't get any symptoms. No symptoms. It, it okay. depends. If it is in the visual axis, then mm -hmm. they might notice it sometimes. But if it's off axis, they won't even know it's there. So if we saw that in primary care, wouldn't really bother about if, that? Yeah, if it's off axis, yeah. yeah you tell them you've got a little speck in the interface, mm -hmm. that'll go away. But if you tell them the surgeon left a piece of tissue, next time he's <laughs> go to his lawyer. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Questions for the audience, then? <laughs> yes, so which was the first lecture today? Anybody remembers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Maybe some big round of applause for the So, thanks for coming, everybody, and making it a grand success. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for the fantastic talks, thank you so much. And our sponsor is for Pharma and all of the sponsors, so thank you very much. And safe journey home. Your CPD certificates will be emailed to you in due course. And for future events, please go on rateddoctor.com forward slash events. There's a lot more events planned for the rest of the year. Thank you. Oh, prof. Oh, oh you're coming. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you. One last thank you for the